Welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian, episode number 35. Now this episode is kind of a... Actually, it's it, it, it worked out this way. This episode is Ryan Donahoe. Ryan Donahoe is the other host of the Forcecast podcast, uh, an amazing Star Wars podcast with previous guest Daniel Barry. Um, this is also the longest podcast to date. And it... Guys, you are not prepared for the stories that are coming from Ryan. Uh, he's from L.A., but grew up in Tennessee, and we talk about that because we kind of have that in common, me being born in North Carolina, growing up in Florida, just the difference in cultures and adjusting. Um, Ryan worked for ESPN, which is a really big deal because he grew up loving sports, and he has one of the best stories I've ever heard. And uh, it just goes to show that if you have a dream and you are willing to put in the work, it's going to it's going to happen. Like there's no other option here. And Ryan's story is amazing to go from uh and you'll hear to go from a five year old kid recording sports interviews on a karaoke machine to interviewing Steph Curry and LeBron James at ESPN. Like it's nuts. Uh Daniel, I know you're listening. We talk about you a lot on this because you're amazing. Uh, and of course, you can't have a host of the Force Cast on without talking a little Star Wars, so we do that as well. Um, but this conversation uh, was so good, I totally forgot to get him to plug himself at the end. So I'm going to do it at the top. You can find Ryan on Twitter at R.M. Donahoe, D-O-N-O-H-O. Um, you can find the Force Cast on iTunes and uh, at ForceCastNet on Twitter. Definitely go check them out. A um, couple great dudes. Ryan's great. This was a really, really good conversation. Um, so I hope you enjoy. Yeah, without any further ado, here's uh, the interesting podcast, episode number 35 with Ryan Donahoe. Theme song time! <laughs> You're coming in great. All right. What's up, Mr. Balance? Oh, not a whole lot, Mr. Donahoe. Yeah. Just trying out this new software. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's uh, it's strange. I've been using Call Note to record uh, for, you know, since the beginning. And yeah. up until now, it's been great. But the latest version of Skype doesn't work with <coughs> it, mm, which yeah. is real dumb. <laughs> right. So I've been, like, shopping around, and I found one <coughs> called... A multo, a multo mm. call recorder for Skype, and that's what I've got right now. Nice. Well, on my end, you're coming in super clear, like way more clear, clear than Daniel ever does. So ah, take that, Daniel. Good. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which he's every week he's in the worst possible spot for his Wi-Fi, but you know. Sure, sure. It's it, all right. You know, you you have a you have a flavor now. Yeah. It's like you know, the, it is what it is. When Daniel comes in, he's in the worst spot. Yeah, that's just what it is, man. You get used to it after a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's up, man? Oh, not a whole lot. You're in Tennessee. I am in Tennessee, yeah. Uh-huh. What part? Uh, Chattanooga. It's uh, Chattanooga. Yeah, Very it's bas- it's basically the bottom of the state where if you dry, I mean, you could throw a rock and you're in Georgia. So oh, it's, right on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's about as, as uh, close to Georgia as you can get without being in Georgia. So, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. I've been to I've been through Tennessee. I went on my way up to Illinois. Drove through Nashville in the mountains. Tennessee's really pretty. Yeah, it's a beautiful state and it's weird cuz it's almost like it's it's so I mean it's almost like Florida too where it's so different where you know you look at the difference between central and south Florida is like almost like it's a different world. Oh yeah. Um it's kind of like that with Tennessee where West Tennessee is Memphis, so you've got sort of so much flair with Memphis and all that it it represents, and then you sort of get Middle Tennessee, which is Nashville, so you sort of get, you know, the whole Nashville scene with music and sort of, I mean, it's it's almost, it might as well be a, its own state, Nashville, and then you get to Eastern Tennessee, which is where we are, and it's 
it's a whole different state. So it's kind of divided into three states. And really, once you get to the mountains and once you get to, you know, in the, the middle part of the state, it's 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 a really beautiful state, man. I know I, I crap on it a lot on the show, but, you know, I, I don't I actually don't mind living here that much. So. Sure, sure. My brother just moved to Clarksville. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he's in the Army, so he got restationed. And Clarksville, the same sort of thing, because the base is actually in Kentucky. Mm. But he lives in Clarksville, which is the closest you can be to Kentucky yeah. from Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Same oh, yeah, I know all about that. Same yeah. sort of thing. You're, so, but you're not from Tennessee. No, I'm originally from uh, Riverside, California. And I lived there for about... I, it's always weird because I don't actually know because I don't really remember any of it. So it sure. was it was a couple of years, and then my dad was in the Air Force. And so mm-hmm. from there, we lived in Colorado Springs, uh, really? C- Colorado, obviously. And, uh, yeah, we lived there for a couple more years. And then by, we moved to Chattanooga when I was, like, four to five years old. So it wasn't – it was a it was a big part of my childhood because – this is, that's the thing. All my family is still in Los Angeles, and then it's just my immediate family that came here. So, I mean, it was sometimes twice a year we were going out there all the time. So, yeah, it's 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 always been a weird thing because it, it, I just feel like I don't necessarily belong in the culture that's around here. Sure. You know, my wife is from here, grew up here, born here, and so going to her family for things is just night and day difference to <laughs> yeah to like ours because like will the first time we started doing holidays when we were dating um she was like uh my parents were just like hey it's uh it's christmas eve you know who wants tacos and then like her family's like everyone brought a dish and it's like casseroles and and turkey and fried chicken and like everyone's got this sort of thing so it's it's always been just a weird cultural thing for me, which is, I think, part of the reason why I've always sort of felt weird, like I don't necessarily always belong here, sure. because, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm into a lot of different cultural things, and here, especially, and I don't, I don't want to like generalize, but for the most part, especially where I live, it's all like you're either into college football and hunting and you know four wheelers or you're an outsider so sure, sure. you know it's always it's a part of me's always been like you know I don't necessarily belong here so that's funny we have a very similar story in the sense that like I I'm from North Carolina oh, yeah? and when I lived on a farm up there up until I was like six and then moved down here to South Florida and it's very very different as well everything here is very beach centric and yeah. I've never been a big fan of the beach I prefer like, oh, yeah. forests and things. So it's, it's what what do you call home? Do you call Los Angeles home? Uh, you know, my whole life, I always people would always say, "Where are you? Where are you from?" And I'd always have to say, "Well, you know, because I've lived here for twenty years." So I mean, it's it's Same. it's foolish. Yeah, it's foolish to kind of be like, "Oh, I'm from California." I always used to say, "Well, I'm originally from California." And I, but I'm, I'm from here. I mean, I was born in, or I, I was born out there. I was raised here. I always used to say I'm basically a Western. It was like we took the Western culture and we were a Western family growing up in the South. And that's sort of how I always described it. Sure. Um, but as I've gotten older and, and more mature and, you know, I just kind of accepted and I, you know, I'm from Chattanooga. It is what it is. Um, so a lot of people now when they, when, when I was younger, if, if you knew me, you knew, Oh, he's from Riverside, California. Sure. But now, now it takes a while to for me to actually get around to that uh, after knowing people. And like, we talked about it on the show only because I was going out there for the premiere. Otherwise, you know, everybody that listens to me every week would know that they just think that I was always from here. So, right, right, yeah, I'm I'm literally going through the same thing. I was like, all right, I've been here this year. It's been 20 years now. Oh yeah, I've lived in Florida, and I still have that moment. Like, where are you from? Well, you know, I mean, I'm not from here, you know. <laughs> uh, my, yeah. my my girl, my fiance now, same thing. She, her whole family, she was born here, raised here, everything's here, and uh, yeah. it's so strange. It's, such a it's strange weird, thing. isn't it? it it's really weird because you feel like you. It's part of you, obviously, because you, like I said, all this all this stuff is part of me, and I. You know, all all of my childhood was here and all that kind of stuff. But it's just like something inside is just always, at least for me, it's just always like, you know, uh, it's always like a what if kind of thing. What if I oh yeah didn't didn't grow up here? Which is funny because this year, um, or actually just last week, we made the final decision um, that we're actually going to move to Orlando uh, in January 2019. Really? So, 
Yeah. So after two decades here, you know, I think it's because it's sort of a combination of like, I never really stapled myself here. So like I was always, I always told myself if I ever got older and was ready to leave, you know, like I said, that part of me that's always been like, well, you know, I'm not really from here. Yeah. <laughs> and and then you kind of add that with my wife who's always been here. So her kind of thing is I'm ready to get out. Like I've spent my whole life here. Right. And so, you know, it's sort of like a perfect storm between job and house and kids and everything that fell together that it's like a fi- I mean, it's official official as officially you can get um, that at the end of this year, as soon as Christmas is over, you know, we're packing the, the whole thing up and going down there. So right on. Yeah, man, we'll be a lot closer. So yeah, exactly, go. exactly. Maybe Daniel will come through a little clearer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope so. We'll see if we'll see if he's allowed in my house after a couple shows. Yeah. So. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man. Um, so so probably, you don't. What's up? It probably helps like going back a ton because I know for me going to North Carolina every time I would go back, you know, you're around family more and you're like, okay, cool, yeah, this is the ilk I'm from, you know, sort of. Yeah. Thing. So it's like a yeah. refresher. Yeah, it does because you know it's in like uh, I took my the first time I took my wife, we she was a girlfriend at the time to California. Um, you know she sort of she sort of got it, and I always because my parents, I you know people always ask me if they get to talk to me, they're like, wait, you lived in Southern California and your whole family's out there, and you chose to live here, like, and I'm <laughs> like, well, it wasn't my choice. They didn't ask four year old me what I was thinking. So, um, but you know when I took her out there for the first time. She kind of got why people go out there. The weather is always perfect, For and real. the everything from the dining to the shopping to the opportunity. It's the land of opportunity. I mean, everybody it is. goes out there. Everybody goes out there with a chance, you know. And so, but I always appreciate it because my parents just being out there and listening to my family talk. Um, living out there is tough, uh, so I always appreciated that they did it to try to give me a better life. So it's always sort of I got the best of both worlds. I came out here, which I think was the better opportunity for me to grow up. Sure. And then I also get to go back and experience the good parts of it. So it was always easy for me to to really appreciate where my whole family is and where their roots are. But then also to to say when it's, you know, it's a million dollars to buy a house that you yeah. think is, is simple. Like the house that, you know, if you buy, a, let's just say, a $100,000 house out here in Chattanooga, it's going to cost you 700000 out there. So it's kind of like... I appreciate that they saw that we have a better chance to to have a better life out here. So, you know, I always it's, it's I got the best of both worlds. So, I mean, honestly, I've come to terms with with where I grew up and and with who I am. And without it, I obviously wouldn't have met my wife and had my kids. So it's at the end of the day, I, I, I'm a firm believer it's always meant to be. So, for you know. sure, for sure, I live in the same sort of thing where, like in Naples specifically, you're not gonna find like a condo for less than 180 grand. Yeah. Right. It's nuts. And then it's like, oh, if we just go up one state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's like night and day different, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Why are you moving to Orlando, of all places? Well, my wife has always, like, when we were even dating, she had always talked about it. She just said, I always feel like I'm I'm meant to be in Florida. I've always feel like I just, I'm just meant to be there. It's always where they vacationed growing up. It's always just, I don't know, she just always said that she's meant to be there. And for me, like I said, I'm. it doesn't matter to me. Sure. You know, like. I'm if we stay here, then that's fine. You know, all You're my kids here. will grow up. Yeah. And then if we if we move to Orlando, you know, it's it's sort of like a perfect perfect storm. And I like I said, I'm a firm believer in like sort of looking back at the steps to bring you where you were. So Sure. Um, you know, first off, we're both huge, like huge Disney parks fans. So, I mean, I went to perfect. Disney Disneyland since I was six months old because we used to live out there. So Sure. Um, and she, uh, she's a huge Disney parks fan. So it's an opportunity for us to, to, you know, go there quite often and take our kids and stuff. And then, you know, it was so, sort of weird that she'd always been talking about it, always been talking about it. And then Daniel, who, you know, hosts the show with me mm-hmm. came into sort of my life. And from there I met his best friend, Abe, who is a really good friend now of ours. And so it's just sort of a weird sort of almost like a sign almost, I guess, that, sure. you know, we're really good friends with both Daniel and Lindsay and then Abe and his his wife, Whitney. So it's like two really good sets of friends. Um, you know, right now, the last week, it's been like 17 degrees every single morning. So, yeah. and I go to work, I go to work at four o'clock in the morning. So I kind of waddle out there sure. and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's 17 degrees and I have to like 
get a bottle of water to pour the ice off and like scrape it off my windshield and it's freezing. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like people, people are like, Oh, you, you don't ever experience seasons in Florida. And it's like, well, for two decades I've experienced seasons. So I think exactly. I'm good. So I <laughs> yeah. think I can, I can suck it up when it's 50 uh, in December rather than 17. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, it's just, it's almost feels like it's just something that my wife said she's always called to, I've always been open to it. And then once the show started rolling and then just the idea of the opportunity for us to, to do this show together, you know, if we're, if Daniel and I are going to do the force cast for 20 years, yeah, we're going to open more doors for us to sit next to each other than we would, you know, and that's not one of the reasons I'm moving my entire family, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, why'd you move to Florida? Oh, I host this star Wars podcast. And so we thought we'd move down there, but that's right. Uh, but it's, I think it's just a, you know, we're ready for something different. Um, we know people down there. Uh, it's It'll work out for the show. We love Disney parks. We love the beach. We love warm weather. So, you know, what's what's the worst that could happen? It blows up in our face and we move back. So, right. You know, it sounds pretty, that's, sounds pretty perfect. Yeah, I, I think so. And then the way the doors are opening, it just kind of, it just kind of seems like if, if I don't want to stay here for the sake of staying here and then 10 years from now ask well what if we move to orlando you know right. i just i i hate that's one of the worst feelings i could ever have is the what if question because at least at least if i try something and fail i won't ask myself what if absolutely so. it's way better to to swing for the fences and to not at all Boy. yeah you know i just i i think when i was about 18 um i sort of just told myself you know, everybody told me when I was growing up, they were like, you know, you've got to have a, <clears throat> you've got to have this period of time in your life, you know, from like 21 to 28, where you just like find yourself, right? And you mm -hmm. go through all these, go through all these relationships and you, um, and you like, you know, fail and, and, you know, get fired from a job and, you know, sow your wild oats and do all this stuff. And I thought, you know, when I was like 18, I'm like, do I have to? Like, <laughs> I wonder if I know what I want to do. Yeah. And I, I know who I am. And I just, I just do it. Right. Like that's, Absolutely. that's always, that's always been my question. Like, I was just like, you know, wonder if I, you know, I just like, wonder if I, wonder if I just don't have that five year period where I just, you know, have seven bad relationships and three failed jobs and I have a ton of student loans. So like, oh, yes. you know, I, I only have, I've only been with one girl my whole life. You know, I married the person I dated for the first time. Um, right on. And I'm 20, I'm 24, about to be 25. And I'm already at the, the career that I'm going to be at for the rest of my life. And so, you know, I just sort of like, I'm thinking if we, if I feel like we're meant to be in Florida, then I feel like it just kind of goes in line with how I've lived my life since I turned an adult. And it's just like, okay, well, if we're supposed to be in Florida, then let's just go and see what happens. So. Well, sure, and that's just the way to go. That is life. Life happens. You gotta, you gotta roll. And I agree with you. I'm, I'm the same sort of way. When they're like, just go and like waste a, a ton of time to learn. It's like, what yeah. if I, what if I already am at that point where I would be on the other side of it? Yeah. So I mean, yeah. do you, do you, uh, which one do you like better? I have to ask. Disneyland or Disney World? Uh, I'm weird because I'm a big. I have two. Um, inspirational figures that I've always looked up to, and it's been uh, George Lucas and Walt Disney. Good picks. And yeah, so when I go to um, when I go to Disneyland, that's where I mean Walt created that park. Uh, he walked the streets of that park. There's sort of a weird feeling that when you're in Disneyland, if you know the history of it, oh yeah, you sort of you sort of can feel it while you're there. Um, Disney World is way more to do. Uh, you can literally do i mean you could go to that property and do anything like just just name it and you can do it there so it's 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 sort of a double-edged sword i think i like disney world more because you could go there you know a million different times and do something different but for disneyland it's just there's just a i mean savannah probably would know uh if you asked her it's just like a weird when you're in your when you walk on the main street in disneyland it's like you just sort of get swept away by like this was the first ever like theme park to do this. So, sure. you know, I guess that, I guess it's like, I'm sort of biased. So if I, if you like, you know, said, Hey, pick one or you're, you know, I'm going to open this trap door on you. <laughs> I'd probably pick, I'd probably pick Disneyland just, just because of what it means. Sure. I also prefer Disneyland. <clears throat> I, yeah. I heard, I, I heard the show with Daniel though, right? You said you didn't even go to like a park until you were what, 20 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I hit, it's so funny growing up in Florida. And then having never been to Disney World and actually went to Disneyland first. 
And yeah, that's right. The biggest perk is Disney World is like, you know, divided into five parks because it's massive. Whereas, yeah. like, if I want to go to Magic Kingdom, but I also want to ride Star Tours, at Disneyland, I can do both. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. A- at Disney World, it's a, it's a, it's so big. You got to do two different things. And um, just for the sake of convenience, I was like, can't we just do this? <laughs> yeah. I love Disneyland. We were there literally from opening till closing the wow. whole day. It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it has that small park feel while also being, you know, being a really legit park. So um, whenever, because my wife had been to the park only, like, she went to Disney World when she was two, and that's the only time she had been there, and they just never went back growing up. And then I've, of course, like I said, I've been since six months old until, you know, 18, I was going almost every year to at least one of the parks. If we were in California, we'd go to Disneyland uh, every once in a while. Disney World's an eight-hour drive, so we just take a drive down there. Sure. Um, but so when we started like getting serious and it was like 2012, um, we were dating and I said, well, we got to go, uh, obviously meet my family out there, but also if we're going to start going to Disney parks all the time, um, I want you to see Disneyland first so that, you know, it, it you can kind of get the feel of Disneyland. So that way you don't go to Disney world first. And then a lot of people go to Disney world first and then go to Disneyland and they're like, Oh, this is basically magic kingdom, but smaller and there's not enough to do. Right. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, for her first real park experience that she remembered, you know, we flew out to flew out to Anaheim for like three days and just did like what you did and just park open. We walked in the door and we didn't leave until we were the last ones out. So, you know, it's it's just a really special place to me and it always will be. You know, if we move to Orlando, my kids can't experience the same thing. I mean, my son's already been to Disney World and he's only two. But, right. uh, you know, it's I just it, I don't know. It's It's a special park to me, I guess. So. For sure. For sure. So when did did you did you play any sports growing up? Yeah, I played. Uh, I was huge into basketball, really, um, and baseball. Um, football, it was never like a really organized thing. Sure. Um, but you know, everybody just tosses football around. But right, um, yeah, I was huge into playing basketball. Played that all the way up until I, I think, was. I was in high school and I tried out. I mean, I'm only five ten, so look, it's not you know. Hey, taller than not, me. Well, you know, they're not picking, well, you know, Brian, they're not picking us first pick in basketball. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I consider myself a pretty decent pickup player. And so I tried out and got selected for like a select team that would like practice against the actual team. And I'm like, eh, no thanks. And so my, my sort of journey then switched to like, okay, I can't, I'm five ten, so I can't play basketball. You know, what happens if I covered the sport instead? So yeah, I mean, sports has always been like a, Probably, if I had to name one, it's probably been the biggest pillar of my life growing up with sports. Really? That's really interesting that sports play. The sport led to the interest of the sport, which led to the coverage of the sport. That's pretty cool. Usually, it's Yeah, I always, I always, like, there's tapes of me as a kid, like cassette tapes, that we had this, uh, we had this karaoke machine and I had this microphone and cassette tapes and there's tapes of me somewhere. My parents still have them, I think, mm-hmm. um, the, of where I was doing a sports radio show. What? And I was like, yeah, I was like talking about, I think it's like, you know, the green Bay Packers did this and Brett Favre. I and mean, I was just giving like the daily sports topic. And so ever since I was probably five or six years old, which is a weird dream. Cause most people are like, I want to be an astronaut or a veterinarian or whatever. And I was like, well, I want to be a sports radio talk show host. And which is just like a weird dream to have as a five year old. So, into it. you know, when I stopped at 5'10 and didn't go to the 6'6 like I thought I was going to be, <laughs> um, that I never really had a chance to be, um, I thought, well, I've always had this dream in the back of my head of being a sports radio host. So I'm going to go for it. And so I basically spent from age 15 until. Um, I got to live the actual dream. I actually uh, just fought every day to try to to fulfill that dream, and I actually got to got to host a sports radio show. So that was pretty cool. That's amazing. So what what goes into becoming a sports journalist? Like what what road did you take from being like I want to be a sports journalist to ESPN? <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, strap in, Brian, because this is not a long story, but it's kind of a long story. Hey, give so me, give me it all. All right. You you made a mistake by having me on cuz I like to talk. So <laughs> That's why uh, I had you on. <laughs> yeah, well Daniel Daniel tried to set the record for for longest one and I don't I don't I don't know if I want to challenge him, but I do talk a lot. So, um Good. but yeah. 
So when I was uh, 14 or 15, and like I said, I sort of made the decision there that I wanted, this is what I wanted to do was I love to write, um, you know, I love to write, I love to clearly talk. And so uh, I wanted to, to do that. I want to be a sports journalist. So I basically just from there, like I said, like we said earlier, where I said, if I know what I want to do, I don't want to waste time, you know, find, quote unquote, finding myself. I just want to do it. Sure. And so I started taking advanced classes, extra classes in high school, um, didn't go to parties, didn't drink, didn't talk to anyone, didn't really, I didn't have any girlfriends, I didn't do any, I just put my head down and went. And I just, um, I got to graduate six months early because I had enough credits. I had like way too many credits because I was taking, I mean, if there was a way to take something for double credit or extra credit or summer school, whatever it was, I just said, I want to. I'm done with high school now. Like I, I don't want to get the same thing out of it that everybody else does. I want to just get out and, and do what I want to do. So mm -hmm. I graduated in December of 2010 from high school and immediately two weeks later was in college. Um, I went to this Christian college in Cleveland, Tennessee, which is about 20 minutes up the road. Uh, Lee University is what it's called. Cool. And I was uh, studying telecommunications and sports journalism as a minor. And uh, <clears throat> so I just basically went at it and just, like, dissolved into it. Um, one of my professors was a radio DJ, and I was only 17. I hadn't even turned 18 yet, and I was walking around college campus in January, and one of the professors was a radio DJ, and I just every day would just pick his brain about everything. I mean, and he would tell me about the business and how it worked, and so – then I would just listen every single day to sports radio 24-7. I would just turn it on in, in my car or I'd turn on uh, – podcasts are sort of – in 2010, they were around, but they weren't really around. Right. Um, so I would just try to go online and listen to sports radio shows from all over the country and just all day long, you know, you know, when I'm walking around or working or whatever, just listen, 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 listen. I would just read, 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 read. I'd buy – issue after issue of Sports Illustrated and ESPN the magazine and just go online and newspapers, the New York Times, every, I mean, everything. I was just reading, reading and writing. And, and so I would write uh, for, you know, for class and all that kind of stuff. And then I was in college for two years and I had some scholarships, but it was still like student loans started piling up. And so I kind of looked at myself and said, I can keep this up in a very difficult business. I mean, because nowadays with the Internet, trying to do anything in journalism or radio or anything is so hard because you can buy a $10 mic and get a free blog and you're doing, you know, sports coverage. Oh, so yeah. it's hard to actually stand out and get a real job. And so <clears throat> after student loans started piling up after two years, I just said, you know, it was another crossroad moment where I said, okay, I can keep doing this for two more years and have $50,000 in debt and then hopefully get a job when I get out and maybe, you know, cover high school football or something. Sure. And so I just said, or I can stop now. I don't have that many student loans. I've got two years of college experience. I've learned a lot doing this. Um, and I can just chase my dream and see where it leads me. So I did that. Um, I got a job, like a real job, and part-time. And then the rest of my time, I started a blog. And it was called... Uh, it was called Full Court Hoops, I think, and I did, uh, it was like thefullcourthoops.com, and I bought the website, I started a podcast, and every single day, I would just cover the news, and no one was reading it. Like, I would look at the stats, and it'd be like three views, Sure. and the podcast was like two downloads, and I'm pretty sure it was me and me, <laughs> and me, like yeah. me listening to the first time, and then me re-listening re to see how bad it was. Of course. And so this was probably 2000, late 2011, early 2012, and I just kept on doing that over and over again, started a Twitter page and a Facebook page and started spamming everybody. I just started, you know, real writers and stuff. I would just say, like, hey, check out my work, check out my work, and they were always like, you know, either, you know, buzz off or just didn't respond. Sure. And so I, I did that blog for about six months. And then I had six months of catalog. I had a, uh, you know, I still have mic. It was like $10 mic. I still have it. I always sit it next to uh, the mic I use now, just as kind of a reminder of where I started. Yeah, that's awesome. And so there was this, there's this ESPN radio station here in Chattanooga. Like ESPN radio, for those of you who don't know, they have affiliates all over the country. And uh, so they have, you know, on almost every state, they've got at least a couple. So it, it means if it's, Affiliated with ESPN, uh, ESPN program, programming is on there all day. And so I just emailed the program director uh, for this station, this ESPN radio station. And I said, 
look, I went to college for two years. Here's my experience. Here's my blog. Here's what I can do. You guys don't have a writer on your website. You don't cover basketball in this area because it's all about college football in this area. Can you give me a job? Like, just I'll do anything. You want me to sweep your floors? Whatever. Just give give me a job. Sure. And so this was like early 2012, and he just, you know, I, and I didn't hear anything back for like a week. Then all of a sudden, I got an email, and he's like, this is intriguing. I've actually been thinking about adding some writers to the site and uh, maybe try to cover some local basketball around here. Why don't you come to my office and talk to me? So I was like, oh. there we go, foot in the door. And uh, and so I went and talked to him, and I was like, look, dude, you know, I got, I'll do whatever. I'm, I'm, I was dating my girlfriend at the time, but I'm like, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. I only have a part-time job. Whatever it takes, I'll do it. And he's like, all right, well what are your plans? And I said, I'm just going to email every PR department around here and say, I work for you guys and see what I can get me. So <laughs> like two days later, uh, I got an email back from the college around here, which is the university of Tennessee at Chattanooga and their head basketball coach. I set up an interview with them. And so I went there like completely unprepared. I'd never done anything before. Uh, I wore like a really oversized suit, um, that my grandpa had. I mean, I looked terrible. And yes. like, I, <laughs> I'd never had done an interview before, so I brought like a uh, my iPad and a keyboard, and then I brought a recorder, and so I sat there and like tried to type it while I was talking, and it was really slow, and I wasn't actually writing what he was saying. I just like pretended like I was writing, and I was like, "God, I recorded this," and you could tell the PR department head was looking at me, and the coach was like, kind of like, "This guy, what did we, what did we agree to? Like, why did ESPN <laughs> Radio hire this guy? Like, you know, he's he's uh, you know he's 19 years old." He looks, uh, you know, ridiculous in this, like, weird 80s suit, and he's not typing what he's saying. Like, I was just <laughs> writing gibberish. Right. So I was, like, sweating the whole time, and I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. So I went home. Thankfully, the whole recorder had the entire interview, wrote a really long piece, and then, like, the uh, radio station and the college was so impressed with it. They were like, you know, I think it was because their expectations were, like, in the basement for sure. what this article was actually going to be. But they shared it all over, um, you know, it got, like, traction, got, like, I think it was, like, 100,000 page clicks uh, and really started going everywhere. And, you know, I kind of got attention for that. Right. And so I took that inter- I took that interview and that piece and I sent it over to the Atlanta Hawks, which is the NBA team, uh, about two hours away in Atlanta. And I said, look, work for ESPN radio station. Here's the coverage I did for the local college basketball team. Can I get some press passes? And they're like, well, we're not going to give you a full season one, but if you want to cover some games, hit us up and we'll see what happens. So I said, what about tomorrow? And they're like, okay. And so the very next day I got in another terrible suit and uh, (laughs) drove all the way down to Atlanta for two hours and walked into Phillips Arena in Atlanta, walked through security. They had my name down. They had me a press pass and I walked in and I was in an NBA locker room in an NBA uh, media room. And I had an NBA press seat where, you know, I've been to NBA games my whole life paying like $200 for these tickets. And these people had my name on a seat reserved. What? And I was completely out of, in and out of my head. I mean, all the media members were in like jeans and a button up shirt. And they're like looking at like, who is this guy? <laughs> Which is a common theme for me, I guess. And so I just sat there and wrote and got interviews with the players um, in the locker room afterwards. I just, you know, there were players sitting by themselves and you could tell the media really wasn't interested. And I just walked up and talked to Joe Schmo, the last player on the bench that didn't even play in the game. And just over time kept going back to more and more Hawks games. And, um, and then, so I eventually, uh, you know, I eventually got on the radio. So my dream was always the radio. It wasn't necessarily writing, but I kept doing the writing and Eventually, they're like, okay, the program director's like, you want to come on our drive time show, which is from three to six, and talk about the the NBA. Like, the finals are going on, you know, you want to talk about it. And I'm like, sure. So I still have them on tape. Um, I think my grandpa recorded them for me, my very first couple of radio appearances. And I talked about the NBA, and, like, callers started calling in saying, hey, this guy's impressive. Uh, You know, finally, you're talking about some basketball, and started asking questions, and so... It went really well, and then eventually I got to be a guest host on a show. So there's a Super Bowl winning running back who played for the Falcons in Atlanta. His name was Gerald Riggs, and he had a show, but he since he was like an NFL player, he like never showed up for a show. So they always had to do like a fill-in host. Right. And it, it was from 6 to 7, and the guy was like, all right, you wanted to do this? Host the show, 6 to 7. 
ESPN radio, it's yours for an hour. Do what you want with it. Wow. And so, you know, my, I, like I was 20 years old and I sat down in front of a microphone, uh, that said ESPN on it. And for an hour I hosted a show and I helped them do remotes like radio remotes at Buffalo wild wings. And, you know, I was talking and meeting people at the radio station and, uh, you know, I wasn't making, but like 75 bucks a week. I wasn't making yeah, any sure. money. Off this. And, but it was just that I got to live my dream. And so from there, I wanted to see if I could make some money for it. So Sports Illustrated had a branch of their coverage online at a website called Fansided. And they have like a network of sites covering all teams and all sports and entertainment. And I just emailed them in my resume, sent them my tapes on the radio and said, you hiring? And they're like, actually, we need a national NBA writer. It's a paid gig. Um, You want it. And I'm like, let's do this. And so you know, my name was under the Sports Illustrated banner. Um, you know, every article I wrote, I led the NBA coverage. I hosted an NBA podcast. I interviewed um, quite a few people. I kept covering the Hawks. Now even more, like they gave me more access, the bigger I got. And uh, and so I got to interview, you know, Stephen Curry one-on-one, who's like the biggest NBA player outside of LeBron right now. Right. Um, you know, Kobe Bryant, growing up in L.A. or being from L.A., the Lakers are like, you know, huge for me. And so – They were in town, and uh, I was in the hallway. First one there for that game. I was in the hallway, and Kobe Bryant came walking down the hallway, and it was just me and him, and I got to just chat with him for, like, 10 seconds. I mean, I just said, hey, Kobe, how's the knee feeling? He's like, oh, you know, I'm old as hell, and he kept walking. (laughs) But, you know, as a kid, I grew up watching this guy since I was three years old. And so I've got all these memories, and I've got to live my dream, and it's not my career. I don't cover sports anymore, but it's it's led to a lot of opportunities, and that's it sort of gave me the mentality in life that, like, you can sit around and wait and hope that, like, oh, I wish I was a famous artist, or I wish I was an actor, I wish I was a director, I wish I was a radio host, but if you have the talent and you have the will, just go ask people and just do what you want to do, and just, the worst thing that anybody can ever say to you is get lost. Mm -hmm. And and I've learned that, and that's what sort of drove my my everything, where I was like, okay, this girl I'm dating, you know, this this whole experience with the sports journalism thing was like, okay, this girl I'm dating, she's the one. What am I waiting for? Will you marry me? Um, you know, now I want to move to Florida. What am I waiting for? I'm just going to move to Florida. Um, I want right. to start a Star Wars. I want to start a Star Wars podcast. Let's start a Star Wars podcast. So I know that was a long winded answer, but that's sort of my story of what happened, and it just sort of I think it shaped that. That from basically when I was 17 until I was about 21, that shaped my sort of attitude on life because I got to just, you know, I had to keep pinching myself over and over again saying, you know, you just interviewed the MVP of the NBA. You just talked to Kobe Bryant. You just sat down and watched an NBA game with a reserved seat and a media as a media member. Like that's the stuff you dreamed about since you were, you know, like I said, those tapes at five years old. And, you know, when I got to sit down and turn on the mic and it said live on air and I hosted a radio show. It's like, that's the stuff you always dreamed about. So it's, it's, it's my message to everybody all the time. when I talk about the sports journalism career, I was like, yeah, I don't, it's not my career anymore. It's, I didn't get to fully live out and do it, but I got to, to be able to say that I did. So I always tell people just whatever your dream or passion is, just go and don't, don't stop going until you get there. So, you know, that is amazing. And that, that story is exactly why I started this show. Because oh, yeah. of stuff like that, like y- the idea that it was something that you always wanted to do and that you went for it. And I always say something's going to break. It's either going to be you or it's going to be your big break, you know, yeah. specifically in entertainment. Like there's so many people doing everything. And like yeah. you said, with a blog, like you, you had that blog and we're doing it when nobody was even listening, but yeah. you kept doing it because you knew. And then it broke. Eventually things just happened. That is amazing. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, I don't like, I, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with like, look at me kind of stuff. Sure, um, sure. Cause I like, I'm not really comfortable with too, too much with social media. Cause it's a bunch of just like, Hey, look what I'm doing. Right. Um, uh, tell me about it. And I, there's, there's always a bit of ego in doing like a podcast cause you're just talking and uh, you know, hoping people listen to you for two hours. So like it's, oh, yes. I can't, I can't say I have like zero ego, but I just, I'm always like kind of. You know, I just, I just believe in everyone. Like, I kind of believe that sort of yeah. like the reason, yeah, the reason I kind of connect with Star Wars is because, like, you can be a farm boy and you can save the galaxy. So right, you can live in Chattanooga, Tennessee and still be a ESPN radio host. You can do what you thought you could do. It doesn't really matter where you are, where you came from, or 
what you do if you want to do it do it so i always like if i ever use my story it's try to help people sort of inspire you it's like you know you right now if your dream is to be you know a, a famous artist and work for for lucasfilm like you know you may only be drawing for yourself and putting it on your tumblr page and you get seven views and you know a couple people like your work that's fine and but you just do it and keep doing it and just reach out to people and the worst they can tell you is no and so that's always my 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 sort of message to people is like every opportunity I've gotten, including the force cast is me just saying, Hey, you know, can I do this? And you know, I, there's for every, yes, there's, you know, seven no's, but you know, I, I, I just think the, you, if you put it out there and you just try most of the time, you're going to have some level of success. We are wired the same way. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I do the same thing. And this show as well. There's so many people that I'll watch like an interview of. I'm like, they just seem like a really nice person. I'd like to get to know. I send out so many emails like, hey, do you do podcasts? And more than half of them are like, nope. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's cool. Right. <laughs> I know that. Well, I know that way too well because people will talk about sort of the guests that we've had, whether it be, um, you know, Podcast 66, Daniel and I's first show, or the Force Cast are always like, you know, how, how, did you, how did you book that person? I'm like, just asked, man. Yeah, like, exactly. And for every yes, there's 12 no's, but the one yes is what matters to me. I don't care about the 12 no's because it doesn't matter to me, but I care about the one yes. And that's what a lot of people just always, you know, they're always hung up on the, on the 12 no's. And I'm like, the, you know, those will always be there, but it's the one yes you get that can really change your path. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's so cool. There's just there's something beautiful about a kid mm -hmm. who's recording sports shows at five from a karaoke machine to recording yeah. sports shows for ESPN. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 amazing. You know, I was taught we had an email or email from a listener, and at the end of our last show for 2017, I just kind of felt like I wanted to give that message out there, and I think I said something like, "Look, whatever you want to do in 2018, do it." Like, you know, you want to start a YouTube channel, you want to start a podcast or blog, or you want to be an artist or a filmmaker, like, just do it. Like, there's nothing stopping you nowadays. Um, you For know, you sure. just, if you got a phone and an internet connection, you can do whatever you want. And an email or, uh, or a listener emailed us and said, like, hey, I don't know if that message was for me, but I've always wanted to be a filmmaker and I want to go to film school and I just don't know if I should do it. And I said, I told that, that story to that uh, the same story I just told you, I told to that person, I said, look, you know, I don't, um, you know, I don't, I don't get to do, I got to experience that three year period of living my dream. And I don't do that for a career now. But because of that, you know, I've done, I do a podcast every week, I'm doing the talk radio show I've always wanted to do, right, but it's just not sports. And if you have a dream, if you're flexible, you can still I, I to me, I'm living out that dream every single week. You know, to a pretty decent amount of people, Daniel and I get to do a talk show mm -hmm. and get to live out a lot. Of, I mean, I got to live through through the show I've done. I've got to do a lot of cool stuff, too. So, you know, it's like if you want to be, you know, an actor, if you want to be whatever, I just think that, you know, nowadays, you know, like the reason why Walt Disney and George Lucas inspire me is because Walt moved to California with $47 right. and look what he turned Disney into. And George almost killed himself just to live his dream of making star Wars. You know, yeah. he just, he got the movie made and he was like, okay, just like me, like I got to host an ESPN radio show. I was like, okay, if nothing else happens, there we go. I'm good. But then for George, it exploded. And now, you know, he sold his company for $4 billion and yeah. for Walt, <laughs> you know, his, you can't go anywhere without the name Disney being there. And it's all because they did that. So I, I tell people like, you know, now more than ever, you're set up to be like Walt Disney and George Lucas. If you've got a dream and you've got, $47 in your pocket, you could one, you can one day be, you know, like you could one day be lining up in front of the camera and they say action when you film a Star Wars movie. You know, if that's, if that's your dream, just don't stop until you get there. Exactly. That's another reason I love, uh, I love the rock a lot just as a person. Cause he had like $6 and lived on like a mattress he found. And now he's the biggest actor in the world. It's like, dude, yeah. hard work will always yield a return. No matter what, it may not be in exactly the same way you thought, but it will. Dude, that blog means so much. You had six months of nobody even yeah. listening, but you still did it day in and day out. You know, yeah. so you were already building up to where the second you're mo it, it's that whole thing about like luck is preparation means opportunity. Yeah. You know, and you were so prepared that at the time when it was game time, 
pun intended, uh, <laughs> you were you were ready. You know, that's yeah. that's so cool. Had yeah. no idea. Had no idea. How long did you do that for? The uh, journalism. Uh, basically, I, when I got my first gig at ESPN Radio, I was uh, I just turned nineteen. So I was in college from uh, age seventeen to nineteen, and then. The moment I got out of college, I started the blog for six months, and so I was still 19. So from 19 till about 22, I got married when I was 21, and Daniel and I started the show when I was 21, and so it was sort of like I was still, I was transitioning out. I, actually, this this is what's funny about it, is so when my sports journalism career was winding down, when I realized, okay, I got married, and now I'm ready to, I'm ready to start that part of my life. I'm ready to start the family and have the wife and, you know, get a, get a real job and sort of, you know, do all that kind of stuff. You know, when, when the sports journalism career wasn't making the money and when I, when it became clear that I was not going to do this full time, I said, okay, I'm going to transition out of this and I'm going to leave with two, about two and a half to three years full of great experiences. And, you know, just, Stuff I, you know, who knows? I'm still only 21. When I'm 40, who knows what happens? Right. But uh, so I was transitioning out of it. And so Fansided um, was starting a Star Wars site called uh, DorksideOfTheForce.com. Mm-hmm. And they had tried it once with like a set of people and it just like blew up in their face. So they sent out this mass email to all the staff and was like, look, we're trying to relaunch the Star Wars site to try to turn this into something. Movies are coming. We've got to we got to make sure we have something to cover it. Um, you know, is there anybody that would like to help? And it's funny because in May of 2014, um, um, a month after I got mar- married, I was still, like I said, I was transitioning out of the NBA coverage. And mm-hmm. Daniel had email, or Daniel had followed me on Twitter. And, um, you know, basically I was like the biggest Star Wars fan ever from age four to age uh, like 13 when Revenge of the Sith came out. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't really watch the Clone Wars like because I said my mind shifted to the sports journalism thing. Right. And so Daniel had followed me on Twitter for the NBA coverage because he's a huge NBA fan, and I guess he just found me on there. Right. So I, I followed him back. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> um, and, uh, like, I don't know why, because I didn't always follow everybody back, but for some reason it was like, you know, I should follow this dude back. You know, I don't know anything about this guy. Right. Um, and I just don't know why I did that. And so he started tweeting from Star Wars Weekends uh, that May, like a, like a week later in May. And I was like, man, you know, I really like um, – Star, I forgot how much I love Star Wars. And these tweets are, like, really getting me back in the mood. Right. And so he tweeted this picture of him and Jimmy Mack from Rebel Force Radio, and I'm like, what is like, what is that? And so I listened to that show, and I was like, holy cow. Like, this is talk radio, which was my dream, but right. for Star Wars. And so I started listening and listening and listening to every episode they had done. And funny enough, I went back and listened to, like, Force Cast when I learned that's where they came from. Right. And it was like enamored. I'm like, okay, I, I got to do this because my talk radio career was over. I mean, it's it's ending now. I'm winding down. And so I emailed back and said, I'll step in and help with dorksideoftheforce.com until you find somebody permanent. And so I, it, this is like j- late June, early July, 2014. And I said, um, and I was like writing some stuff for Dorkside and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I just was like, you know what? I still want to do something in media. Um, there, I looked online, there was like 11 Star Wars podcasts. And so (laughs) I was like, I was like, you know what? I think I can do this and I think I can do it. Not as good as rebel force radio, but I think I could do it. You know, I think I could, I think I can do it. Right. And so I just like, but who on earth? Like, I don't want to do it by myself. I'd done enough of this staring into a mic and talking to myself. So I was like, I got to have a co-host, but no one around here likes Star Wars the way that I do. Right. And if I nobody, everybody would think I was weird if I just spent the last three weeks listening to hours of a Star Wars podcast. I hear you. So so like everything in my life, just if I want something, just do it. So I don't know Daniel from anyone. And I've never even interacted with him. All of a sudden, this random DM comes into his inbox. I'm like, hey, man, you want to start a Star Wars podcast together? And he was like, yeah. You know, at first he was like, you don't know me and you don't know what I sound like. Are you (laughs) sure? I'm like, yeah, dude, let's do this. I'm working on this site, dorksideoftheforce.com. It's tied in with Sports Illustrated. I've got the experience. Let's just do it. So he called me, and we spent about uh, a month and a half just planning, 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 and we launched the Podcast 66, and at the end of 2014, I wrote my last sports article and did my last sports podcast. Or you know, I, I officially quit from ESPN and Sports Illustrated 
outside of the dork side of the force thing. And then my, sh- my focus shifted to that. And so it was like, like I said, my dream was always to do sports radio, but because of the things that, that did that, it was like one step after another. And now, you know, here we are. So it's, it's kind of crazy sometimes to just go back and look at sort of, you know, this happened, which led to this, which led to this, which led to this. Yeah. And if you're, if you're not 100% all the time trying to achieve whatever dream or goal you have, how many of those chances are you missing? So I, I'm appreciative that I've always had that attitude. Absolutely. That's pretty nuts. It literally was a baton, a baton pass one into the other to where like sports here ended into podcast 66. That's amazing. And uh, you did, you did a good job picking Daniel. Yeah. Great dude. It's, it's weird because honestly, we're, we're really different people. Um, I can tell that already. (laughs) (laughs) If we, uh, um, which I, I talk way more than he does, but, um, if we, if if we didn't do the show together, I honestly wouldn't be friends with him. Like if if him and I were like coworkers or just we went to high school together, sure, he'd he'd be one of those guys I just knew. Like you know how many how many of those guys you just kind of know? Like you see him at the supermarket and you went to high school with him or whatever. Oh yes. And you're like either you know it's not like I would it's not like I would hate the guy, um, but I just you know it's just he wasn't your type of friend, right? Right, right. So it's this weird thing where we're really close friends now, but we're not like you know we're not the same person. We're not like, you know, BFFs from the beginning kind of thing. So it was like a work of like really hard work to get the chemistry down. And right. it's just sort of, I don't know. It's, it's, I got lucky with him because he basically said, you know, a lot of people, if you look at sort of either radio shows, TV shows, or even Star Wars podcast, a lot of the hosts aren't together anymore i mean yeah like it, it's just not a thing that happens you there's just stuff that gets in the way and life gets in the way and daniel was like i'm hitching my wagon to you and i don't care if this wagon loses all its <laughs> all its wheels we're gonna sit there on the side of the road with no wheels and because of that like it's it's been it's been a fun ride and i think because we're so different i get to learn a lot and i think it's it's better for this show that you have Sure. One guy, one guy on this end and one guy on that end. And I think, I think it's just, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, whatever you believe in God or the universe or karma or whatever, it's one of those things where I feel like it was sort of a meant to be passing in the night kind of thing. Absolutely. And I, I love your show. I think you guys are great. I did. Thanks, man. I did have a question though. Do the Hawks and the Falcons have a special place in your heart now, given their, their spot in your story? Yeah, um, the Hawks more so than the Falcons, mm-hmm. but I, I'm, a, I'm an L.A. sports guy through and through. I always root from the Lakers, the Rams, the Dodgers, but mm-hmm. the Hawks, I always sneaky root. I mean, I'm still friends with a lot of the PR people there. Um, you know, that was my, was my first, like, thing. Like, it was sort of, right. you know, You're those shot. are the first, yeah, those are the first players I ever interviewed, and so... I always now that I'm not covering them and I have to pretend to be objective like I <laughs> I I do root for like if I'm a, I'm a huge Lakers fan but number 2 is the Atlanta Hawks just because you know when I'm 60 and I get to sit down and talk to my grandkids about the same thing I just told you it'll be that team and so I always I always just I, I I'm a big fan of never forget where you came from so Absolutely. That's that's part of where I came from was that team because that's you know and then like I said the Falcons too and you know the fact that if old Falcons running back never showed up to do a show was the reason I got to do a radio show so you know it's just it's just one of those things it's just a it's 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 one of those things you'll I'll never forget and I'll always be that first interview I did with the the college coach in his office drenched in sweat in a 1980s suit <laughs> you know I always uh, he's he's at I think he's he's moved like way up the ranks he became a really good coach and he's like coaching at a really I think North Carolina State or something now oh hey um yeah I think he's I think he's there now I don't know um I still have his phone number I don't I don't I think if I text him he would probably call the police but <laughs> um you know I, I I always root for him too just because it's like these are the people that gave the 18 year old that was clearly out of place they gave him the shot and so it's always people like that you know we tell the stories of like you know Walt and George but like all these people had other people opening the doors for them so I always mm-hmm. I'll always give like love to the people that gave us a chance so that's so cool so when you're doing sports journalism, right, what, as somebody who has no idea, what does that job actually entail? Well, it depends on 
what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason why I don't like, I don't really like the industry as much now as what it, what it was when I was growing up and sort of romanticizing it. Um, sure. As it used everything like that. <laughs> you're right. It, it, it used to be like you went to college, you got out of college after you got a four year degree before college was $900,000 a year. Yeah. And you worked for your local newspaper and you covered whatever, like, you know, you covered curling, you know, down the street at some old folks home, right? Like it was just whatever you did. And then if you were good, they then put you on middle school football and then they put you on (laughs) high school basketball. And then you went and covered the college and then, you know, you were a beat writer for a pro team. And then if you were really good in about the early 2000s, they started putting newspaper writers on TV and then on radio. And so by the time I turned 18, it was my turn to experience that. Newspapers were dead. Um, you know, so you couldn't get a job at a newspaper because they were lucky to keep the people they had. Right. Um, and if you wanted to be on TV, you had to be really loud and just say stuff you didn't even believe. Just just to say sure. it. Like just to, yeah. Just, <laughs> just to, to be, be heard. Con- just to be heard and just to be contrarian. Like, everybody likes Kobe Bryant. Well, I'm going to be the one guy that says he sucks. Right, and right. And then I'm going to get on TV because I'm screaming really loud. Yeah. <laughs> and it was sort of like the same for radio. All the main sports radio host and stars that had the biggest shows were just going on there and just saying just loads of crap just because it got ratings and people tuned in. Sure. And so since the internet became sort of the home of now all writing journalism, like nobody ever, it, I mean, there are people out there, but nobody ever really like, okay, I wonder what happened last night in sports. Let me go run by the grocery store and pick up a newspaper. Like you just pull out your phone, type in ESPN.com, and then there's all the articles and the scores. Right. For free. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So for me doing it, like if you're a writer, um, I for like when I was covering the Hawks, for instance, so I would go down as a national NBA writer for that job. And then I would also be as the local Hawks coverage for ESPN. I would do that job. So I would go down to the game. We would uh, have before the game, the coach would have a press conference. And so you'd go there and you bring your recorder and you everybody would ask him questions. And so you'd sort of keep that down in in your mind. And, you know, nowadays you might tweet something the coach says or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you watch the game, keep, you know, take notes, pay attention to what's happening afterwards. They open up the locker room, you go in there. um, And since I was a national writer, a lot of times the Hawks, because I just sort of knew them by now, Mm -hmm. I would go into the opposing team's locker room to try to get a national story. So if the Lakers were in town, I would try to get a Lakers story. If the Orlando magic were in town, I'd try to get a magic story. If uh, that's when LeBron James was with the heat. So, I would always go to the heat locker room when they came into town. And uh, and so you would sort of get quotes and get all that kind of stuff. And every once in a while, like, I'd get something where, like I said, I, I stumbled upon Stephen Curry just sitting by himself with his feet in a, mo- in a uh, mop bucket. Mm-hmm. And so I just walked up. And like, I was like, this is, like, one of the best players in the league, and he's just sitting here. <laughs> so I walked up, pulled out my recorder, and just asked him, like, like 15 questions and had, like, a 20-minute interview with him, something now that you'd have to – really fight for to even get close to him yeah and so i so i like ran back to the locker room and i sort of transcribed the interview and made an article around it and then i would email the editor and say hey i just scored an interview with stephen curry and then you know they'd share it everywhere whatever and then i'd write a game recap for the local one and maybe throw in some quotes from a player because they would always give you a sheet of what the player said afterwards if you if you didn't want to go in the locker room so i'd sort of tell what happened if they won or they lost and i'd write maybe a five paragraph article just you know here's who's here they play next here's who did well here's what the coach said after the game and before the game and that part was always the best part of it because you're experiencing what's happening right um the mundane part of it is when you'd be on like what's called a news desk and so you'd sit at home on a computer have twitter open have a bunch of games on and just sit there and either write game recaps for a game you weren't at or just write like you know, Kobe Bryant's out for two weeks with a knee injury, so you'd have to just sit there and write about write about that. And that that part's kind of boring. And that's sure. what I was doing. That's what I was doing with the blog when I first started on the on the full court hoops blog, was I would just scan news stories and do that. And so the fun part of it is doing features, doing interviews. You know, I would I would interview uh, beat writers for teams. I would interview players when I was in the locker room. I would try to write uh, sort of like a uh, history of a player's career. Like when LeBron James reached 10 years, I wrote this long, like huge editorial piece about it. That part's fun when you sort of get to do the storytelling thing. But a lot of the job and why people just try to drop out of it now is like, you're either doing really boring mundane, like James Harden shaved his beard and, and it's just like, sort of, it's just so boring or, you know, 
if if you if you actually try to have real standards because everything is so clickbaity now, like it's all about clicks, clicks, uh-huh. clicks, clicks. If you're not writing about the news, you're having to write something outrageous, like um, the website Screen Rant or whatever for Star Wars. Like the oh, moment yes. the la- the moment the Last Jedi were out, like I saw articles from them. They're like, the Last Jedi confirms who the Knights of Ren are, and I'm like, did you see the same movie I did? Because <laughs> That didn't happen, but you have to. It gets people to click on the story. Oh yeah, and, and so it's sort of the true people that try to be like really honest and 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 have integrity and try to to really cover stuff the right way. It's sort of starting to dissolve into who can scream the loudest. Sure, right? who it's who's first over who's right. Who's first over who's right, and who can say the most outrageous things to at least get you click. Like if we never want the force cast to be like. Coming up, why you know why Disney has destroyed George Lucas's legacy? Like I just, like I don't believe that, and I know a lot of people would listen to that because they would get really mad about it and it yeah. gets fired up, and they think they think, like people think nowadays any click and any emotion is good emotion. I'm like, or we could have an honest discussion right. about it, and I just think that like because of Twitter and because of uh, online now you only get paid if they click your story like mm-hmm. before you you print a newspaper out everybody get used to get their newspaper thrown on their porch every every day because they had a subscription well now you only get paid if they click the story and if i click you know here's some good thoughts about the last jedi you're more likely people are more likely to click the one that's you know says you know the new solo movie's a dumpster fire rather than here's why it might be good you know you're more likely to click the dumpster fire because mm-hmm. it's a dumpster fire for sure and you know, it's like I could either look at a, you know, just a clean article or I could look at this thing that's completely on fire over here. So that's another reason why I sort of left the business. I wasn't making too much money. And also it was just sort of, you know, I got to live my dream. And the radio part's the best part. I mean, I do that every week on, on the Force Cast because mm-hmm. it's just fun. And you you have a podcast and you do a bunch of different ones. It's fun to just talk about what you want to talk about. So Absolutely. That's part's the best, and that's why I always wanted to do that. But you know, it's it's a it's a business that's changed, and it's affected. You know, like I said, even entertainment journalism, it's just all about you know, like you said, who's first and who's loudest. So, mm-hmm. absolutely. So, is is your favorite sport basketball? Yeah, easily. It's it's something my dad and I bonded over. Um, my dad didn't have the best father, and so he really wanted to be the best dad he could be because he never had that. Sure. And he's not a like. A, I, this might be hard to believe, Brian, but he's not much of a, he's not much of a talker. So, oh really? <laughs> clearly, I didn't get that from him. Were you adopted? Uh, I'm starting to think so. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, then I listen to my mom, and I'm like, no, I'm not. Yeah. Um, but uh, she, um, but yeah. So him and I would bond over two things. It was basketball and Star Wars. So like, he wouldn't always have the right words to say or anything to say. But him and I could make uh, chicken wings turn on the Lakers and just sit for two hours and not even say a word, but bond over watching the game. And it's still something to this day that if I bring the, his, his grandkids over now and we just go, we can turn on a football game or a basketball game or a star Wars movie and just, just not say anything and know like it's, this is cool. Like this is our way to bond. So it's always, those two things always mean a lot to me, but yeah, especially basketball. Cause he's, He's like six three and was like a top ten ranked high school basketball player in California when he was he was uh, in high school. So uh, he can actually you know he can actually dunk and do all this crazy stuff. Me not so much, but <laughs> you know now that you think of it, Brian, I might be adopted. So um, <laughs> exactly, that's but the no, real he, reason I brought you on yeah, here. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, Daniel did that to me by the way. He just dropped that he was adopted on an episode of Podcast sixty six. We've been doing the show for like two years. He just randomly said, "Oh, by the way, I'm adopted." I'm like, "You didn't right? bother telling me that after like two years of you know." <laughs> Just, just out of the blue, like, yeah, I'm adopted. I'm like, oh, okay. Dude, we're we're doing his episode, and he's like, oh, you know, I got a pacemaker. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did that to me too. He's like, yeah. He's like, I got to the doctor. I'm like, oh, everything good? He's like, yeah, it's just my pacemaker. I'm like, I've known you for four years, and you haven't said that you were adopted or you had a pacemaker, and you just drop it on on air where I clearly can't focus on it. We got to move on to, you know, Watto and whatever else is going on. So right. more important yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Than your heart and your whole life. So, I'm yeah. with you. When he, when he just dropped it, I was like, wait, wait a minute. And then we kept talking, and I forgot about it. But I was like, oh, man, yeah. smooth. Sm- he knows what he's doing. Yeah, he's just not <laughs> a big deal to him, I guess. You yeah, know? you know, it's, everybody has one at some point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so what is uh, – uh, and I'll ask you this one later on as well. But as far as sports go, what is your favorite interview that you've done? Uh, It's probably the Stephen Curry one. That is a good only one. Be- 
only because of who he is. And I mean, it was like right at the beginning of him. I mean, he was an all-star that year. He was, everyone was talking about, is this the new star of the NBA? So it was like, it wasn't like how he is exactly now where little kids like idolize him and he's the biggest star and, you know, outside, like I said, outside of LeBron James. Sure. Um, but I think it's either that or uh, the first interview I did with a player. Um, if you know the if you know the NBA, you'll know him. But it's uh, it's Al Horford. He plays for the Celtics now, mm-hmm. and uh, he was like the Hawks star. Um, and I was at media day. Um, you know, after my first season of doing it, I'd never interviewed a Hawks player one on one yet. Um, I'd only been sort of in the scrum. Uh, and you know, if I interviewed somebody, it was like I said, Joe Schmo on the end of the bench, and it was just a practice interview. I didn't actually record anything he said because. No one's going to read an article about a guy that never even got off the bench. But sure. Um, but this is the first Hawks player and the first all-star, the first real star I interviewed. Um, and he could tell that I was nervous, but he looked at me in the eyes and was just kind of like, it's cool, man. Now, he didn't say it, but you kind of felt that like, hey, you know, right. I'm, just a, I'm just a dude to ask whatever question you got. And so I would just, you know, I just asked him the questions. At the end, I ended like with a joke question and he laughed and, you know, he looked at my name tag and said, you know, hey, Ryan, appreciate the time and shook my hand. And, you know, That's I think cool. it's it's just one of those things where, yeah, for for is Stephen Curry for, you know, him being one of the greatest shooters of all time and players of all time. But um, it was that's the one I'll, I'll probably never really forget is the fact that, you know, he's a star. He's an NBA all star. He doesn't have to give time to this 19 year old kid that's clearly at, over his head and, you know, stuttering and. You know, I'm pretty sure I sweat a lot, so I'm pretty sure in every one of these situations I'm sweating. But right. he's he's just like, hey, man, you know, you asked me about if I'm shooting more three-pointers. And I'm like, yeah, like he finished the question for me and then would give me a really long, detailed answer and ended up being a good article. So it That's was, cool. it was, yeah, it's just, it's people like that that give you hope for sort of, you know, humanity. Sure, because that's a, that's a genuine human connection. It's a genuine conversation yeah. amongst two people, which is yeah, why I'm, I do this. That's this is why I tweeted at you too. This is my favorite. I can't do this style of podcast because I talk too much. So I can't be you where you're sort of just driving the conversation. But I, <laughs> it's I have respect for people that can do shows like this because it just it makes you realize that we're not all as different as sometimes as it seems. And at the same time, we all have unique stories to tell. So I, I, I've listened to every episode of your of your podcast. Have you? Uh, yeah, the interesting podcast. So that's and awesome. I, I, I'm not just blowing smoke, man. Like it's Chris Hardwick is really good at it, but yeah, yeah. to me, to me, you're you're on like that level. Like I do believe that five years from now, I'll be bragging that you know I was on the same show as you know Tom Hanks or whatever, whoever you end up interviewing. You oh know, my God, that'd be amazing because he's yeah. the he's the reason I did it. It's so cool. I, just, yeah. I love that, and the, just the the idea of people being because we all are people in this together. But at the same time, we all have our own experiences that we can go through the exact same thing and have different reactions to it. Yeah, and that just fascinates me, and uh, well, it's just cool, man. Well, we're in such a 140 character, six second clip. Like that's our society now. Oh yeah. That I think we've sort of lost the humanity of each other. Hundred percent. And so, if you can actually have some nuance and just talk for an hour and just get to know people. You know, right. that, that's that's why I think you're doing really important work. Like, you know, at the end of the day, the Force cast is just, you know, amazing. Not, well, <laughs> we're we're one in 500 of the people that talk about the news and do all that kind of stuff. And you like us or you don't. But like shows like this, I think, are important for like preserving humanity, because I might have like a crazy look on things. But I, I tell this to Daniel all the time. I said, I'm afraid that we're going to look back at 20 in 20 years from now. And Twitter is going to be like one of the main pillars of downfall of our society. Just right? because I think it's dividing more and more. And we're just not – we're looking at people at 140 characters. I guess it's 280 now, whatever it is. Right. 280 characters at a time now, and that's not how you're supposed to treat human beings. You're supposed to treat them with years of you know experience, and, and we all screw up and stuff. But, like, it's not – you know, I, I just feel like I, I, I can't like it's Twitter is one of those things where I wish it would just burn and go away. And I feel so much better when I'm not on it. But I also <laughs> I also can't get off of it. You know, it's just a weird it's a weird thing. But, yeah, I, I I do think that hopefully, you know, you never stop doing a show like this and just talking to people, because even if it's you know, even if it's like a, a schmuck like me, hopefully you can, you know, at least be interested by just people because they're always interesting. Right. They are. Hence the name. 
Hey. <laughs> hey, hey, it's like I you're thought pretty, about it. <laughs> yeah, you're a pretty smart guy. <laughs> I'm just copying you. So what do you what <laughs> what equipment did you record on originally? Because you said you had a little recorder, right? Yeah. So because um, I'm into the details, man. So and this is the same mic I had for for podcast sixty six. Right. Um, so I went to Best Buy uh, when I when I first started full core hoops, and I was working at a grocery store part time, living with the parents, didn't have any bills. Like my parents bought me a two thousand uh, dollar, you know, like twenty year old car that barely ran, um, awesome. and so I didn't really ha- yeah, I didn't really have any bills or anything. So any money I made could just be used for whatever I wanted to use it for. So. Sure. Um, I went to Best Buy. I started the blog and I purchased the website. Like instead of just doing like dot blogspot dot com or whatever, I just actually bought the website sure. um, for like forty bucks. And then I went to Best Buy and there was like a forty dollar microphone, USB microphone, but it was on sale for like ten or fifteen bucks because it was like an old model that was going away. Right. Um, and like I said, I'm staring at it right now. I have, I'm sitting because I always I always leave it next to me to say. You know, no matter where you go or what you do, you are the same 17-year-old kid with a microphone like that, right? That's right. And so uh, it was plugged in the USB. And if you listen, if you go back and listen to Podcast 66, Episode 1, you can see how terrible the mic actually is. (laughs) Um, And so I just downloaded Audacity, um, the free editing software. Um, I plugged in the USB mic, uh, had a little tripod stand, and that was it. And... Like, I would always try to make it like a real radio show, so I'd say, you know, the Lakers played last night, and uh, they beat the Rockets. Here's what Kobe Bryant had to say, and I would, like, hurry up and put my phone with a YouTube clip up against it, <laughs> and then, like, you know, it, Kobe Bryant would cl- play the clip, and then I'd say, and then I'd edit this music behind it, but I was really bad at it. You know, I, I was on the radio station, and I was really good because I didn't do any of the work. I just sat down and talked, and right. it was like... It was like a thousand dollar microphone and two thousand dollar computer system, and somebody else was the producer. So all I had to do was talk. Sure. Um, and all the rest was taken care of. So I seemed like a pro there. But like now I was on my own. I guess this is before I was on the radio, actually. So when I was actually on my own the first time, um, I would put music behind the show, and the music was too loud. So like the first couple episodes, I don't think I have them anymore. I think I got a new computer and they're lost. My first uh, full core hoops podcast episodes, um, but. You couldn't even hear me because the music was over what I was saying, <laughs> and because I just couldn't. I don't know. I just didn't know what I was doing, and uh, and so when I started Podcast sixty six, that's all I still had. And so I tell the story all the time. But like the first episode Daniel and I did, I didn't understand how to record Skype. Like I didn't. I just thought. I hear I, that. It, yeah, I just thought if I could, if I just did Skype and ran Audacity, why can't we all show up there? Like, isn't that kind of how? And so like we just kept trying and trying and trying. And eventually I was like, Daniel, you know, this is July. I still remember it was July 31st, 2014 uh, at four o'clock. I was sitting in my guest bedroom and my, me and my wife's first house and uh, nobody else was home but me. And I like put the mic, I put it in my phone up against the microphone uh, and called him on Skype. And we did the show that way. And then I started doing more research. But yeah, that was the, <laughs> that was the humble beginnings. I had a, I had a laptop my parents got me when I was in 11th grade for Christmas. I had a $15 microphone, and I had a free editing software, and that's that was what I was doing everything on. And then, you know, slowly it's gotten better now. Obviously, I've got I spent a lot more money on the stuff now, but sure, you know that 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 just proves, like I said, over and over again, you don't need, you know, you don't need what all the people you, like if you're listening to a successful radio show or podcast or watching a successful YouTube channel, you don't need what they have to start out with. You just, like I said, you got a phone and you've got the internet. You can do whatever you want. That's right. That's right. What Do you still edit on Audacity? Yeah. Um, I do things so weird. So I, I did videography for quite a few years. Because I've ah, always been in, in, into movies and whatnot. Yeah. And I don't know how to edit audio. So yeah. what, what I do is I, I put it into Adobe Premiere, because that's, pro- that's a program I know how to use. Yeah, I, yeah. I only work with the audio. I cut it and like adjust the levels and then export the MP3. Because wow. I don't because I don't know how to edit audio. <laughs> that's that's awesome actually. It, it's like the hardest way to do it yeah. because that's not what it's made for. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's It works. Hey man. There's it's, a learning like curve. MacGyver <laughs> over here just whatever it takes, man. That's right. Uh, whatever it takes. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Dan, I I still just record on Audacity and then I I used to do it all on Podcast 66. That's why, like, now the end of the show's run, um, it was much better than the beginning. But that's why I should hope. The, that's why, the, yeah, right. <laughs> the, the 
that's why the music was still too loud. That's why the sound was just so bad because I'm, I, I'm not like I studied how and how to talk. I didn't study on how to do like you can, when you're studying sports journalism, like if I think if I stayed all four years, they would have taught me the technical side of it, sure. but I only stayed for two years. So they taught me how to run my mouth a lot. Right. Um, you're like, that's all I need. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm good now. All right. Thanks for the, thanks for the lesson. I know how to talk now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but Daniel is like a, I guess he studied music and he, you know, he's went to the audio. So he's really good with audio. So now the shows get sent to him after we get done recording and he, you know, he, he does what he wants with them. And sometimes when we've got a ton, like, we just don't have a ton of time all the time. So sure. if we have a lot of time, he'll really pour into it and, you know, touch every second up. And if you go back and listen to our holiday specials uh, on podcast 66, you can see like his full range of talent. Cause he's just, super talented and good at it way better than all ever like i can't you know yeah <laughs> like i just I, I just can't like i just can't do any of it so he's like super good at doing things and he's recorded like skits that sound like uh, actual radio drama place i mean it's just he's he's the he's the brains behind all the audio stuff i just you know like i said i i've got a really expensive microphone a really expensive soundboard and the rest is him so that is awesome yeah. it's such a it's such a weird awesome medium the idea of podcasting because you think radio is like being phased out but then internet radio is just as popular as radio radio it's so strange it's like radio just because that's where i learned everything right uh, it's got so many rules and it's got so much red tape and so much sort of you've got to you've got to play by this construct but like podcasting you can just do whatever you want and yeah you know, like radio, I like sometimes Daniel has had the reason why it's so good that Daniel's my co-host and it's not like another radio guy mm-hmm. is because I don't I like sometimes I always try to default to those rules and those sort of things that they teach you. Sure. And then Daniel's like, just give me the steering wheel. We're just going to go ride into the ditch for a while and see what happens. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. you know, I need that because if not, you know, it would be very, you know, organized and, you know, sort of segmented and like podcasting is beautiful because it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be that, you know. You you can have a forty five minute show, or you can have a three hour show, and it can be completely different. You can have a show like this one, which is just a conversation, mm-hmm. or you can have a show like you know Rebel Force Radio, where it's like listening to radio. So you know, it's just I think when you start sort of breaking rules, you get more opportunity for talented people to step up, and they don't have to follow you know your stupid rules you've had for forty years. So. For sure, I totally agree with that. Daniel saved my life on his episode. Because my, like, like I said, I, I used to record with Call Note up until literally now. Yeah. And uh, it, it didn't record our episode at all. Wow. So that episode with Daniel is actually him recording on his end just because. He's, yeah. He's like, I'm going to record too. I'm like, all right, sweet. You know, there's no harm in it. Yeah. And at the yeah. end, I was like, oh my God, it didn't record at all for me. Yeah. He's done that for us. If you, if you listen to our Last Jedi review show number one Mm -hmm. i sound a lot different because the file for some reason on my end was just really bad and like it was just really staticky and a lot of stuff was cutting out and he just happened to be recording on his end and so you know he's uh he's the man i couldn't have asked for a you know better co-host like we've had our we've had our beefs sometimes and we've had our frustrations but you know it's uh as all friends do yeah let's be honest Right. I mean, it's if when you talk to somebody every single week and a lot of times every single day for almost four years, sure. You know, it's you're bound to have. You know, he's such an easygoing guy, and I'm really not. Right. Um, <laughs> ask Daniel to tell you the story about celebration at the tops booth one time. Oh, um, really? uh, you'll see how uneasygoing I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but yeah, it's just uh, it's like yin and yang for us. Like it's 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 a good balance. So you know, no, or I guess uh, pun intended. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I wish I had I wish I had the last name like Balance. It's pretty great until you're clumsy. And then it's <laughs> then it's the worst. <laughs> yeah, then it's like I, a pun. That's right. I always say that I don't utilize especially being in Star Wars podcasting, I don't utilize my last name anywhere near enough as I should. But you can like if you ever just did a different Star Wars show, you could just call it like, you know, Balance of the Force but with your last name instead or something. You know. Oh I'm God. not good at Can you imagine? I, I'm not good at names. If you listen, I came up with Podcast 66, so okay. that's that's your definition of me uh, being good with names. So that was probably the worst podcast name you could ever come up with. So I don't know. You know. I think you just redeemed yourself with Balance to the Force because that's amazing. Uh, something like that, you know, because Balance is a real big part of Star Wars right now. Exactly, so. and I'm Jedi Brian. I'm Perfect. Just, I'm going to steal this. 
<laughs> Man, you have full. I only want forty percent of royalties, and that's it. You can have the rest. Forty so. percent of zero is something I can totally handle. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, it's always, it's always fun, man. Podcast is definitely a passion project. It you don't, is. You don't, you don't get, don't get into it for making money because you're not going to. There is zero out here. <laughs> so yeah. speaking, speaking of podcasting, you have what was order, uh, order, order sixty six. What was podcast sixty yeah. six is now the Force Cast. Yeah. What went into that decision? So Daniel tells the story differently. That's and why I, I ask you. And I don't <laughs> know if we just didn't weren't on the same wavelength or what, but. Sure. Um, he, so we, we were doing, we'd done the show for about, uh, two years, two and a half years. Mm-hmm. And it was right after Carrie had passed, uh, at the end of 2016. And so you just kind of felt weird about the whole thing. Like oh, yeah. we were going to do a show, but then Carrie passed away and we just took like a month off and just didn't, we just like, what do you like? Cause now all of a sudden it just didn't, it just felt weird about it. Right. Sure. And that going into the fact of that we've done this for for two and a half years, we've we've had mild success. Like, you know, when we first started Podcast 66, like I said, there was maybe a dozen Star Wars podcasts. Two and a half years later, there was easily three to four hundred. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, it, it was just you sort of felt weird about everything. Like, what, what, if, what is our place in this? Right. I hear you. And our name was really bad and it was really hard <laughs> to find the show. Right. Like we'd had we'd had more success than I thought we ever had because I. After the first episode, being a radio guy, I, I just thought like, okay, this I'll give this three episodes and this thing's over with. Right. Um. But uh, like I said, Daniel just was like, nope, we're doing this until you know until we set on fire and blow up. So, um. So we had we had started to head into twenty twenty seven twenty yeah, wait twenty seventeen right yeah we started head no, it was twenty sixteen I'm sorry I'm sorry yeah wait no, <laughs> yeah like, okay you know what twenty seven. 2017 was such a long year. Like it doesn't feel like celebration oh was in 2017. God, you're right. 2017. It feels like it, it feels like it was in 2016. She so died it was okay. 2016. Yeah, we were heading into 2017. Celebration was on the horizon, and so I just, mm-hmm. him and I were just talking, and we're like, do we want to change the name and just maybe try to change the format? Just, just like you know, it's like in a marriage. Do we want to just spice something up? You want to like move the you know the sure. cracker to a different spot on the shelf to see if that changes anything? Like just reevaluate. Yeah, and so we were sort of talking back and forth with it, and he says that um, we could do – he was going to do Podcast 66 forever. Like, he said that – we were on Coffee with Kenobi, and he said that. And I'm like, we didn't have that conversation. <laughs> like, I even pre- I even presented to him. I said, wonder if we ended the show after 100 episodes and just stopped. We're done. Like, we quit. That's it. We did more than we ever thought we would. 100 is a good number. Let's just stop. And he was like, I'm down for that. And maybe – because so I've been talking about it for years. Maybe if you move to Orlando, we'll pick it back up. And, like, it was just weird. Like, you know, Carrie had passed away. We just didn't know what to do. And right. so we were trying to – we always try to be transparent with the audience. And so we were like, you know, at the beginning of the first show, I just said, look, we're going through some changes. Uh, it might The show might end at 100 episodes. We're at, like, 85 now or whatever. So, you know, celebrations right around the time we're going – we hit episode 100, like, two weeks before celebration. Um, you know, that might be our last hurrah. And we were honest with everybody. Because it just felt like something needed to change, and so at the same time, I really wanted to write again. I, you know, even as as boring as Monday and as news writing could be, for some reason I missed it. Sure. And so I reached. I'm like, you know what? The is is the like it's the Sports Illustrated of Star Wars. Um, oh you know, yeah. It's it's been there forever. It's the legendary site. I don't know anything about them. I just went on the contact page and found Dustin Roberts, who has been with the site forever, and uh, he's the content manager. So I just emailed him. I'm like, here's my resume, like like I always do. Um, can I write for the site? And he was like, no. Um, <laughs> he's like, we're not looking – get lost. We're not looking for for contributors. Hard pass. So I'm like, okay, fine, fair <laughs> enough. Um, so we get farther into the year, and Daniel and I every day are texting. It's like, you know, what name – is there even a name available anymore? Because, you know, it's just – so many names, so many shows out there. Should we just end it? Like it was getting closer and closer to time. It was around late February where I emailed again. I'm like, are you sure you don't want me to write for the force.net? And the guy, Dustin's like, you know what? You can email me articles and maybe review some rebels episodes for me. And then I'll post it, but I'm not going to give you access to the site. It's going to be posted under my name. And at the end, I'll just write Ryan. Ryan is a friend of the force.net. Sure. And so I did that a few times. It was going well. And then right before celebration, it was in March, and I said, "Hey, what are you doing with the Forcecast uh, network?" Because the Forcecast had like ended really weird, um, and the show was over with. It ended in March of 2016, so it almost been a year since uh, the show ended. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are you doing with it? And he's like, yeah, you know, again, stop asking me questions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Dustin was like, who do you think you are, kid? Like, you know. Right. And uh, so uh, I said, well, wonder if Podcast 66 just joined the Forcecast Network. Let's do it. And he's like, you know, I don't know. Like, you know, your intro kind of sucks. Your name kind of sucks. Like, who? <laughs> like, what? A, you know, he's just like, you know, no. And uh, so we actually agreed to it a little bit before celebration um, to join the network. Um, and then it fell through. It just first. I don't still really know the full story, but it just it didn't happen. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was like early April. And uh, I'm writing for the force.net officially now, like they actually give me access to the site and I'm writing articles and things are, you know, things are going well, like they get me all set up and I have access to the Twitter account now and getting ready to head to celebration as sort of a reporter there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I emailed him again. I'm like, you know, like, you know, because this had been something we talked about for a while. And he's like, I was like, wonder if we brought the force cast back. Daniel and I are looking for something to change. And he's like, you know, I was actually thinking about it you know, maybe the force guest does need to be back. Like Dustin was saying this. And so we both just sort of like talked about it for a little while. And, you know, it was, it was sort of me on his leg a little bit and him sort of, you know, cause I could tell you like they wanted the force cast to be back. Like it felt like it should still be around in fandom, but you know, you just didn't, you know, you just didn't, you just didn't know the way that the show had ended in March of 2016. You just sort of let the bad taste in everybody's mouth. Sure. So finally Dustin's like, all right, let's do this. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. You know, uh, I'm ready to go on the air for podcast 66 right now. Celebrations in like a week. Um, you know, we're going to do the force cast. And so I basically told Daniel, you know, Hey, they've offered us the job, the gig. Um, I really don't want to say no to this. So, you know, I don't want us to break up as a tandem, but like I, we, d- we clearly cannot do podcast 66 forever. Clearly this road is ending. Right. Um, I say, we take this, you don't get, you don't get too many chances if you're a drummer to play drummer, you know, to play drums with the Beatles, like you don't get to, yeah. To, yeah. Like this is to me, that's what the force cast was. It's a big opportunity. Yeah. And so, um, you know, Philip wise, who owns both the force.net rebel scum.com and then Dustin Roberts, who's sort of the boss over everything. Like I, we owe everything to them cause they gave a chance. They took a chance on us when they were like, we had to con- kind of do a little bit of convincing and back and forth with them. Sure. Um, and uh, so they're like, we, well, the, Dustin's like, well, let's just not say anything because it just, like I said, it just ended really weird. Just do your show, uh, end it when you want. And then in the fall, we're doing the 20th anniversary of the force.net. It's the, uh, you know, it's, it's the anniversary of when the force cast launched in 2016. So it's 11 years just, you know, we'll do it then, you know? And so over the next, basically, so when we went to celebration, we knew already, right. um, we just couldn't say anything. And you know, part of the reason was, and I said it on the first episode, part of the reason was is because there is so many Star Wars podcasts. We just didn't want to be like, oh, here comes the big bad boy back on the block. You know, now you all right. sort of, you know, here's the big kid, the the kid that for some reason had a mustache and was like seven foot tall in third grade. Like everybody sort of moved out of the way for him. Like, yeah, <laughs> we we're no, we're just like it. We're the same height as everybody else. We're, you know, we don't have facial hair at eight. So like, no, we're not. There's nothing special about us. Mm-hmm. Um, That was a weird analogy. And uh <laughs> And so he, uh, you know, and I, we agreed like, yeah, you know, there's, we're not special, right? There's nothing special about Ryan and Daniel compared to everybody else out there grinding as, with a star podcast. So we don't want to send the wrong message here. Right. So we just sort of told our audience, look, we launched on August 1st, 2014. And we said on our hundredth episode, cause we knew we said, uh, on August 1st, 2017, we're ending the show. And, uh, we didn't say why we just said we agreed on it. It's over with. And, part of the reason we did that is because like it's 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 almost the same show i mean we're not gonna lie it's there's a little bit of differences uh you know we we are we've still got more to come but it's gonna be a different show so let's put a clear ending on the show that we started because this is our own project this is what started it all for us sure. let's let's look back and just put a stamp on it and say this is this was that show and now this is this show um and so you know i drove down to orlando on uh July 31st, we recorded the last episode, and then, um, you know, we had done over mo- all summer long, you know, I had been reaching out to voice people to do the intro, I'd been reaching out to people to do the music, I'd been, um, Dustin was working on getting the new logo, Daniel was working on figuring out what he wanted to do with the audio, and just behind the scenes, we were still doing Podcast 66, but we were really sort of, just sort of half, you know, really caring, like it was hard to really get up for the show knowing what was coming. So 
that's when we started bringing a lot of different people from the community, like Charlotte, who's been on the show, on your show, Savannah, who's been, you know, you do the dorky diva with her. Um, and so, um, you know, we just started bringing community members to sort of get us amped for the community. Right. And uh, so then we ended the show and then just basically told everybody, look, thank you very much and got some kind words. And then we just sort of, we're still on Twitter a little bit. So, was, you know, don't forget about us, but we just sort of went radio silent and, um, no one said anything. And then on September 3rd, um, you know, the episode was over with, I went and interviewed Claudia Gray. Um, we interviewed, we did the show, um, the Friday before the Monday that was, that was going on there. Um, we were both like for the first time in three years, we were both actually nervous to do a podcast and, sure. uh, and like we did everything, we had it all packaged up. Daniel edited it. I had the interview with Claudia ready to go. Um, we put the show together all the way. We had it ready by Sunday at midnight or Sunday at like 10 p.m. Right before it launched on Monday, September 4th. I sent everything to Dustin. Dustin's like, let's put it online. Um, go ahead and announce it on Twitter. So at like 11 p.m. September 3rd, we changed everything and just wrote, see you guys tomorrow. And launched the show. And it's been, I mean, it's been way past the expectations I did because I really did think there was going to be either blowback or, you know, people were going to be like, you know, because th this is a really big legacy to live up to with what Jason and Jimmy started. So we expect to get a lot of, you know, ah, you're still not Jason and Jimmy. And it's been the complete opposite. So it's been it's been like, like I said, I I have a lot of things I can look back on my life and say, oh, this is the coolest thing or this is the coolest thing. But I honestly think that this probably ranks higher than the sports stuff I got to do. So it's it's been awesome. You've been doing a great job. I remember Thanks. when that happened, because you guys actually attributed to one of my greatest accomplishments, which was having my name on the Force.net. <laughs> yeah, I got to write that, too. Dude, that was incredible. Because I've been going yeah. to the Force.net almost every day since, like, 05. Yeah. Because that's, like, I was obsessed with fan films in yeah. high school, and that was the only place you could find them. Yep, so they the, did a lot of hosting on those. Dude, yeah. the force.net slash fan films was like my homepage when I got onto any computer ever. Yeah. And uh, my name's on there because of you guys. And you're doing a great job. I really, really like your show. I used well, to be subscribed to like, I want to say 15 Star Wars podcasts, but now I'm down yeah. to like three. And you yeah. guys are one of them. Sky Talkers is amazing. But I oh, love yeah. I love the idea. Like you said, you and Daniel are very different. And I think that's what's good. Because yeah. Savannah and I are like the opposites now since the new stuff has come out. Because <laughs> we we, yeah. we love one through six, the books, the comics, Rebels, Clone Wars. But since episodes seven and eight have come out, we start having different opinions. And we still we still love everything. But we're starting to be a little different. So our show has become like almost like a friendly debate. Um, yeah. It's been really fun. The last few episodes have been bonkers. Um yeah, yeah. You, guys, yeah. you guys are killing it. I, I love the Force Gas, man. Yeah, I've been listening to you and Savannah, and that's the the thing I like about both of you two are you're not afraid to just be yourselves. Like, yeah, for real. You know, especially with the position that Savannah's in, working at her her universe, like you know, putting some honest opinions out there could could be kind of dicey sometimes. But she's such a nice person. Uh, you're such a genuine person. Like, I think like being genuine is the best thing you could do on a podcast. Agreed. So. Hundred percent. That and that's what I like about the Dorky Diva is it's just genuine. Like it's just there's no fluff or BS or it's you know you're not saying things for you know just either pats on the back or to rile people up. It's just like, hey, here's what I feel about this and here's what I feel about this and that's cool. And uh, yeah, that's why I really like that. And yeah, I mean for us like the Force Cast like it's being in this chair that I am uh, is sort of like the the driver and the guy that has to set up everything and drive the conversation. It can be like a really really thankless job sometimes and i'm not looking for like oh you're doing great man but it's like you drive the conversation you do most of the talking so mm -hmm. you're usually the guy that people tell is annoying like you're usually the <laughs> annoying guy on the show because you're the one like if i drive the conversation in it the thing i love about daniel is if i'm going uh, like a way that he doesn't even want to go sure and I, th and I throw it to him because we don't do a lot of preparation beforehand we don't really We'll text throughout the day. Here's what we're gonna talk about. Here's what we're gonna talk about. And then we just get and record because we don't have a ton of time. Right. Uh, and so I can just throw him anything, and he'll take it and turn it into whatever he wants. So right. he'll <laughs> he'll he'll build on my topic, but then go the way he actually wanted to go. And that's a special talent to do that because not everybody can do that. I've hosted the show with other people at like Podcast 66 or whatever, and I'll throw them the topic, thinking you know I'm used to Daniel, and they'll just be like, eh, I don't know. And then it's oh. just sort of, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, and moving on. And so. 
you know, like I said, if you're the if you're the guy that drives the show, you can be the one that's annoying because I uh, obviously Brian, I'm taking over your show, but uh, yeah, well, hopefully. the guy, thank God, the guy, <laughs> yeah, the guy that talks the most and the guy that is sort of introducing everything and driving the topics can really get on people's nerves. And there's people that I listen to shows and I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of tired of that guy talking. So <laughs> we really try to have community members on, which is like we've got to we've got to be on the forecast at the same time somehow. <laughs> we yeah. just sort of it'll, uh, it's it'll just, break yeah i mean we'll have to just make an effort to happen but you know we we took the show knowing what it meant to star wars podcasting and knowing that this was where it all really started uh and so to to us like the show belongs to the fandom um right. not us and uh we're just happen to be the current stewards of the show and look i'd rather do it i'll do it until i'm 90 but i just know that sometimes that's not how life works so to us, while we have this position, mm-hmm. we want the show to be for everyone. And so, like, we open our voicemail line or our email, like, every single week and just say, your voice, if you're listening to this, your voice is Im- just as important as mine and, sure. and Daniel's. And so our Star Wars opinions aren't better or, or greater than yours. Listening, please contribute to the show. And that's why, like, we've made a concerted effort. Because when we started in 2014 – there was nobody to welcome us to Star Wars Podcasting. There was no, like, I asked Jimmy Mack to be on the show, and he was gracious enough to do it, se- second ever episode, and he was our first guest. And But even then, like, nobody gave us, like, advice or shared our show. Like, I, it was, mm-hmm. like, there was only, like, ten other shows, so there, it was kind of hard to do that in general. Right. But nobody gave us that. And so when I see new shows start out or I see people in the community that are, really doing good work and really are trying hard. And they're, and they're in the same exact position Daniel and I were almost four years ago. Um, we try to be that those people now. And so we'll usually try to bring them on the show or retweet their post or, or something like that. Cause I just think that while we have the position we have, it could be real easy to sort of get big heads and start bragging and start being like, okay, you're going to listen to us for two hours and we're going to tell you why we're right. Mm-hmm. Or, or we can just have an honest discussion with everyone. And don't be afraid to shout out other people's shows. Don't be afraid to bring on, uh, you know, you or Savannah or Charlotte or um, just anyone. Like, if we, whether we agree with them or not, it's to us, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to make the show about the fandom and not about two morons that talk too much. You right. know, which, <laughs> which is what it could be if we're not careful. So Right, right. I'm into it. You guys do a really good job. Appreciate now, that, man. Now... We're going into Star Wars. Let's do it. This is happening. This, I hope this isn't your longest episode ever, because I feel like it's going to be. It's definitely going to be. Okay. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to say that that was by design when you challenged Daniel at the beginning, but, you know, hey, conversation happens. I, we're, <laughs> we're, uh, it's a healthy competition, but I won Daniel, so you'll get over it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, how do you feel about the, about the new canon? Were you a fan of the old EU? Let's start with that. See, that's the thing. Um, when I was, my Star Wars experience was when I was four, my dad, who was 10 when, uh, the original Star Wars came out, saw it in the theater. So he was hooked since 77. Mm -hmm. He was like, okay, my kids have to connect with this. My kids have to be Star Wars fans. So at four years old, um, I was plopped into a theater. Um, the theater's still open to the local theater in 97 and just plopped into, the theater and saw uh, the special editions in the theater. And then when I was six, the Phantom Menace came out. And so I saw all three prequels up until I was like 13, 12, 13, almost 13. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, like I said, my Star Wars fandom kind of just tapered off there. I saw the Clone Wars movie in theater. I watched a couple episodes and then just sort of tapered off. So I never read an EU book. I never read a Dark Horse comic. I never watched the Clone Wars until after the show was over. And then I binge watched the entire thing. So like, for me, there's only ever been one Star Wars for me, and that's the movies. Um, right, right. The first six movies, um, when I was five years old, we had the, the last original, it came out in 95, the last original copy of Star Wars before the special editions that came out on VHS. I wore those VHS tapes out where my dad had to take them away from me before I ruined them. So <laughs> I remember the summer of when I was five years old, uh, I had Hot Pockets every day, and I went into the side room every single day and watched Star Wars, all three movies, almost uh, every day. I tried to watch at least one full one, and then I skipped around and just watched my favorite parts and ate Hot Pockets every day for that whole summer. Yes. My mom got mad because she was like, you know, you're going to be, you're, you're getting lazy, but 
you know, that was so, so to me, like when I came, when I, when I heard the Disney announcement in 2012, I was covering the NBA. So like, it wasn't like I was all in on that. So I like remember reading the announcement. I'm like, huh, there's gonna be an episode seven. Can't right. wait. For, then, then, I, then I read in the press release starting in 2015. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll get back to it in 2015. Like I'm not, you know, I don't have three years to think about this. So like when now that all the Disney stuff that's happening, you know, and getting to talk to some of the people that are actually involved with yeah. making the stuff, like it's, it's to me, it's, it's, I'm all for it because like I said, it's the only thing that I've ever known. I, I don't have like 20 years of EU built up in my mind or headcanon built up in my mind of what happened. So, uh, you know, I've, I have my action figure adventures of what happened with old man Luke and stuff, but it just, right. as far as me, there's, there's nothing that it's contradicting with. Like it's, it's all good for me. Sure. Which is gotta be a whole lot easier because that's where yeah. a lot of people have problems. Uh, yeah. I think that's why a lot of people have problems with episode eight. Yeah. Uh, but episode eight, uh, you went to the premiere. I did. How? I, I mean, I've listened to the episode. It's amazing yeah. what exactly happened. But, like, what is going through your head when you're getting on a plane to go to the red carpet premiere of a Star Wars movie as yeah. a journalist like you did for sports? Yeah. What? It's it's so weird because I thought those days were over. Like, I what I thought Podcast 66 was going to be was just, like, when I first started, I thought, okay, we're going to be the next Rebel Force Radio. And right. It just after the first episode, I'm like, yeah, that's not happening. So uh, I was like, this could be a cool thing we just do as a hobby, right? It just gives me a hobby to do, and I still hold on to that small dream of talk radio. Like I still have that small dream going on. And I'll never give up with this show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then when uh, when I got the invite to the premiere, I sort of just sat in silence for a long time. And you know, of course, I've got two kids, and my wife's just staring at me, and you know there's actual life happening. She's like, what are you just sitting there for? Right. Um, He's not talking. We should get yeah, this temperature. Right. right. Um, <laughs> I just like, it took me back to that same feeling of being 19 years old and sweating in a coach's office. And I was like this, I didn't think this would happen again uh, to be in the field that I'm in to be, I mean, that's, that's close to the highest level you can get uh, for to get sure. it. In yeah. And so, you know, it, and then of course, everything that could go wrong went wrong as far as flights getting canceled. <laughs> and like, it was, it was literally, I was there in LA for less than 24 hours. So it can't be easy, man. Not with stuff yeah, like this. Yeah. <laughs> but I, when I walked onto the red carpet the first time, it just like, I just froze. And I was like, you know, I, I'm not, st- I don't get starstruck anymore. Like, you know, it doesn't matter who I, uh, after, after you meet your hero, Kobe Bryant, like there's very little that can happen at this point where I'm just like starstruck or, right. you know, wh- whatever. Like I just, it just doesn't to me that everybody's just a human being. So for me, I was like actually nervous for the first time in years. And it was just a, like, I just, you know, every star Wars fan dreams of stuff like that. Oh, and yes. to look to your right and there's Mark Hamill waving to fans and to look to your left, you know, I told Bob Iger, what's up, Bob? Yeah, uh, and well to yeah to uh, see Frank Oz down the ro- down the down the little red carpet there to you know just to just to do though like it's just something that I still it still hasn't set in for me like it's still weird like it's still almost like that didn't it's like just a dream or something because it literally was less than twenty four hours sure um but it's I don't know, I it I think because like for basketball that was my dream my dream was to cover and and meet and interview players and so I. That was something I've always been like, that's what I'm going to do. But for this, it's all like gravy for me because it like that part of my life was over with. And so it just was like, to me, it topped it because it's like, I'm not supposed to be here. Right. Um, you know, I haven't, I, that's why I told everybody when on the and I'm going like, I'm taking you all with me as far as I'm concerned. Cause I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm a gas bag. I just talk a lot. Like, I don't know if I'm actually <laughs> like a journalist anymore, but Definitely. I are. yeah, but I I'm going at least as a fan this time, and I'm gonna I wrote a review, I did a podcast, I did my duty as a media member, but to me it was like I'm going as a Star Wars fan. I'm not going as the entertainment journalist that's covered it for 40 years and is just like oh here's another movie premiere. I'm a Star Wars fan first, and then I'm a media Star Wars member second to me. So I just went the whole time and was just I just. It, like I said, it felt like a dream because I couldn't believe what was happening. And I never, I didn't really get starstruck, but I just felt at a weird sort of, it just felt like it was just a surreal, like it was the most surreal I've ever felt because 
everything basketball, I was just nervous, like just scared that I was going to, you know, this, this, I finally got to a chance to go out my dream. And if, if this fails, this is it. But for this, you know, it's just sort of like, this is extra for me. And so it just felt surreal the whole time. Like I just like felt like I was in a fantasy world. So it was just, it was just weird. Yeah. Right. I, I can't imagine you didn't cry. So that's good. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm not. My wife gets mad at me all the time, but I'm not a crier. So, you know, it is what it is. It's important in that situation. Yeah. You know, that's so how on a scale from one to ten, how difficult was it to not talk about what you just saw? Uh, It was Cause probably it's a lot. It's a lot that happens in that movie. When it when it first <laughs> happened, it was probably like a zero because I was still processing it. But then once I got home. And there was, I saw it on December 9th. It didn't come out till the 14th, you know, on that Thursday night. Right. I got home on the 10th. So I had a good four days where I just had to stay silent. And that was the hardest part. Like, I think Daniel and I sort of got like a little bit of a, little bit of a, not a, not a argument, but like, I had just simply texted him and said like, Rose's theme is really good. And he like freaked out, (laughs) thought that like thinking, oh, dude, you just like, that's a spoiler, bro. And I'm like, trust me, man. That is not a spoiler. Right. Like when you see this movie, that'd be literally the least spoiler thing I could have told you. Like sure. Rose having a theme is not a spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, it was it was like a weird like I'm lucky enough to be living in a place where Star Wars isn't a big prompt thing. Mm-hmm. Um so like most of the time people probably wouldn't even care about where like when I you know, when I'm just hanging out around Chattanooga. But for the most like as far as my Star Wars online like Twitter and podcasts, like I that was the weird, like, it was actually pretty hard not to, because you, your mind races after that first one, and you're just, like, trying to process it all. Oh, yeah. So you want to talk to somebody about it, but I just literally couldn't, because in the after party, I just didn't, I was more of just, like, a take this in kind of thing. Like, just, just I, like, I didn't feel like finding somebody to talk about it with, because, you know, number one, I was there alone, and number two, I just was more interested in, like, okay, experience this after party and you can have hours and hours of star wars discussion afterwards so like i literally just went saw it december 9th didn't talk about it with anybody until uh basically midnight december 5th so it was kind of weird dude and the after party was the canto bite one yeah How yeah they had that? uh that was that was pretty crazy um they just had like it felt like they set up like a casino um mm-hmm. drinks and food everywhere like every five seconds you walked into another drink table or food table uh they had dealers in like tuxedos and they had poker games going on so it just was like a cool like the dj was playing like like top 40 hits so that part was kind of like take you out of it because you hear like you know sure. <laughs> what's i don't know what <laughs> whatever the hottest artist i don't ever i don't i don't pay attention to like hot music so whoever the you know latest whatever beat is going on and then you're also supposed to be in canto bite is that that part was kind of weird but yeah it was definitely like a cool because that was the weirder part because that's where like at, every five seconds you can turn and there's another like celebrity actor star that like you're like, do I talk to that person? But you're supposed to act like you've been there before, so don't talk to that person. Like, right. you know, then I saw some people taking pictures of those people, and like that could have been me, uh, you know. And so it's just like I, like I said, the whole thing. Like, if 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 I don't ever know, I, I don't know if I'll ever be invited back to another Star Wars premiere, but it'll be a different experience the second time because this time it was just sort of like, you know, I was just in a, like I I remember it everything very vividly. It was something I'll never ever forget, and that's why I wanted to record my thoughts as it happened. Right. Uh, and then it's just it's one of those things where it just felt like a dream and it still does. You know, it still feels like it didn't happen, but it did, but I know it did. I mean, you got to watch a Star Wars movie with Donald Faison. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that part was weird. Like yeah. <laughs> like I said, I kind of was just like, why are they up here? Like cuz it literally was just a I I recognized some people from the media that were in that area mm-hmm. uh that I knew were part of the like media Star Wars media, but then like they those two were just like planted in the middle of all these random people and I'm like, what? Are, <laughs> why are they why are they like and that that was another sort like i literally sat like maybe five feet from donald Faison and zach braff while we watched star wars episode eight in downtown los angeles and i'm like just say that sentence out loud you know that, that's <laughs> yeah. such a weird thing to, to think about you're like i'm not sure if i'm in the place i'm not supposed to be or they're being punished yeah i was like did they <laughs> like did they sne- like zach braff said he's like we're not supposed to be here so i'm like you know, are they actually joking or like yeah, cause, exactly because <laughs> you know, there's like not one single other celebrity in this area except for these two so I was like that's just weird that is amazing I hope they snuck in <clears> and <throat> that's how they got into like yeah. well, stick with the media people <laughs> it'd be fitting for those two it so. would <laughs> yeah that is awesome funny. and yeah. there there is a I also like what I like about your show is that you also like the prequels oh yeah because I'm a diehard prequel fan as well because we're roughly the same age I was born in 91. 
Yeah, I was born in 93, so there you go. Yeah, so we're like of that time, and it's yeah. really nice to talk to people who also like the prequels. Yeah. Because fandom yeah. growing up has been a weird thing for me because everyone that I grew up around hated the prequels. Yeah. And I was like, uh... But then when I met Savannah, and since when in this community, I'm like, wait, other people like it too? And it's yeah. re- it's refreshing. Yeah, now, that's why I've noticed that too, and I think that's why you're seeing the reaction to the last Jedi that you're seeing a lot from people that are defending it. Cause you're kind of like when I'm, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, you know, my opinion isn't as valid to people that were 20, 25, 30 when they saw the prequels. And so sure. while they're all screaming that their childhoods were ruined and this is the worst trash ever made yeah. and we're, you know, in middle, middle, middle school celebrating it and twirling our lightsabers around and, you know, reenacting the Battle of Geonosis after you saw it the first time, like, the, no one was listening to us then. And, like, so people started trashing The Last Jedi now, and they're like, you're not doing it to this one, too. Like, you're not, we're not doing this. Like, we're not, That's right. we're not going to have another, we're not going to, like, this is not happening. Like, if you don't like it, fine, but we're not doing the whole ruin my childhood, it's the worst piece of art ever made. Like, we're not, that's not happening again. That's right. And we, it's, we've got microphones and podcasts, and we yeah. are ready. <laughs> yeah, and like we have, like you now, the the five year old's voice can now be heard more because their parents can be like, "Well, here's a video of my kid crying after watching it because they loved it so much." Like this isn't, this isn't gonna happen again. And you know, like all of us that grew up on the prequels are now getting to the age where it matters. We now have the money that spins that speaks to companies. And so, mm-hmm. you know, if you go to Target right now, I was thinking about this the other day. And you go to the Star Wars T-shirt section. It's like a Boba Fett T-shirt, a Darth Vader T-shirt, an Empire Strikes Back T-shirt. Uh, and then like a Leia t-shirt and I, and those are, that's cause right now, everybody that's 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, that has all the money, that's, what's going to sell to them. They're going to like the 35 year old's going to buy an empire strikes back t-shirt. Cause that's what, that was his star Wars growing up. Mm-hmm. Well, pretty soon we're going to be that demographic. So I'm curious to see if all of a sudden there's a revenge of the Sith t-shirt or a Padme t-shirt or, God, I you know, hope so. That's I'm I'm interested to see because now all of us are now old enough and we now have voices that can match where people are sort of like now you now you try to do the funny low hanging fruit joke on Twitter and you're kind of like oh this was the prequels are garbage no one likes those and you, they get flooded with literally thousands and thousands of tweets and they just get shut down and I laugh because they're like oh well look at all these people you know with these wrong opinions I'm like no 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 you don't get it we were here we were here all along that's and right we just couldn't say anything. And I now th- I always think about uh, Hayden Christensen, the yeah. fact that he sold out quicker than anyone else as yeah. for his autographs to where they had to open up other times. Yeah. I was like, please, someone take notice. Yeah, it's here. That's that was to me like we have the money and the voice now. And we're going to and I always tell people that if there's anything prequel related and you're screaming from the rooftops, buy it, buy it, buy it and make these companies start making this stuff because. They can make a prequel thing, and if no one buys it, they can use that against you. Like it may, it, oh, they yeah. can make a they can make the thousandth Boba Fett piece of merch, and nobody buys it, but they're going to keep making Boba Fett. They won't hold it to the same light as the prequels. So, for sure, if there's if there's ever a prequel thing at a Disney store or you know or whatever, if you have to drive two hours, go buy it. Like because that's going to we've got it. It's sad, but we've got to prove ourselves that you know these people exist. So, I have no problem on Twitter when someone's like. You know, the prequels are trash. I have no problem calling those people out and being like, well, yeah, to you, but, you know, <laughs> there's not, there's no consensus on these things. And you're not, you know, you're not going to be the one that dictates it anymore. We we put up with that for 20 years now. That's over with. And that's why I said when we started doing the Last Jedi recap shows, I said, look, I spent 15 years fighting and defending and arguing and getting mad. I'm not doing it with this one. Like, The Last Jedi, to me, rules and is everything I wanted out of a Star Wars movie. And if you don't like it, that's completely fine. But I'm not arguing with you about it because I've done that enough. And I think now you see that generation where, you know, it's like we're not we're not doing that again. We're not repeating you just trashing it because you feel it. You think it's funny, you know? Oh, for sure. And it, it'll come out in the wash. But I, yeah. there, there's one question I'd love to ask every Star Wars fan. Yeah. Who is your favorite Star Wars character? Uh, it's It used to be Luke, obviously, growing up. Because right. I think that's almost everybody's favorite character growing up. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, then it then it was uh, Anakin Skywalker Darth Vader. Um, sure, but I think now, at the stage I am now, it's Obi Wan. Ooh, okay. Yeah, Obi Wan. Just not Ben. Obi Wan. 
Well, the whole the entire character. Of Obi-Wan. Okay. So from from beginning to where he's for some reason there's a ghost sitting on a log in episode six. I like, love it. Yeah. The, um, from the just because and and included in all the animation stuff too. Sure. Because it's a guy. I think the message of Obi Wan is that he failed as a master. Um, and even though he went away for 20 years in a desert, he didn't ever lose hope. Sure. And that he took that hope in the form of Luke to where he just waited and waited and waited and then struck when he thought the time was right. And that look that Alec Guinness gives Vader after he looks at Luke, he looks at Luke, he looks back at Vader and smirks oh, is yes. like, is like the moment of a new hope for me. Cause he's like, all right. You've lost already. You've lost. Like we may have been down for twenty years, but that boy that just landed the let, let, walked on the Falcon. It's over for you. Um, and you look at his character through animation. It's loss after failure after loss after failure after loss after failure. Oh yes. And he and he never really breaks. Nope. And like I said, my philosophy of have your dream and go 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 go. You're gonna have a lot of failure in that. Like you're gonna have. You know, if you're a journalist, you're going to get fired. You're going to have a lot of rejection, but you it's up to you whether you want to lose hope or not. And Obi-Wan, that me, it's like, like I said, failure, 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 failure. Um, but at the end of the day, he never gives up. And at the end of Return of the Jedi, he's smiling at Luke because he was a success. And it's like I said, it's never about for me. Life is never about the 12 no's. It's always about the one yes, and that's sort of Obi Wan in a nutshell. I love that. See, that's what I mean. This that question. That question leads to so much. That's oh yeah, so cool. I love that because every. I mean, e- literally everyone knows Qui Gon's my favorite character. Oh yeah, and yeah, uh, I know. for a similar reason, in that Qui Gon was like the only Jedi in the Republic that got it right. Yep. And the reason he got it right was because he saw the potential in people, as opposed yep. to what the rules dictated. Yep. And that's why he was the Maverick. And I have the same thing, the potential in people and getting to know others and like seeing people for people as opposed yep. to what the rules say that they are. And Obi-Wan is like the one of the perfect Jedi that like I mean, he's so much so that when anything was going to happen, like, we'll just make Obi Wan do it. Yep. <laughs> we found yep. we found Grievous and they just volunteer him. I think Obi Wan should do it. That's eh, a good yeah. idea. You know and- it's a good pick. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, Qui Gon's always been like I always wish he was more utilized after his death, like more than just what the Clone Wars was. Nice. Um, and I hope he's still not done. Um, but I do think that you know, even even in Obi Wan's triumph, so even in Return of the Jedi when he's technically won, um, he's still getting it wrong. He's still telling Luke to go kill Vader. Yep, and that just proves that even if you are at what you perceive to be your highest point, you can still be wrong and you can still be blinded by things. You don't realize you're being blinded by. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the reason why I like Qui-Gon too is Yoda in the last Jedi spoiler, um, takes, yeah, it's my favorite scene in star Wars now, period. Um, incredible, but he takes that lesson from Qui-Gon and is like, Luke's like, or he's basically telling Luke, like, look, you can hold on to this crap in these books, but, you know, it's got to be more than these books and these rules. And what matters is Ray. It doesn't matter about everything else. Like, we failed, so obviously we didn't do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you can use that failure to learn. And that was Qui-Gon. Like, you know, yeah, Anakin's too old, and yeah, he's going to fail and mess up, but, like, if he was around for Anakin, that Darth Vader wouldn't have happened. If I he totally was agree. Yeah. I love it. So... Yoda's like, let's not make that same mistake this time. You already made it with Ben Solo. Like, you created the other Darth Vader because you were afraid of creating Darth Vader. And yeah. so let's not do this with Rey. We've already lost Ben Solo. Enough of this rule stuff, and let's just do this. So that's why I love The Last Jedi. Same, same. Yeah, Amazing. Man. That's like a perfect note to end on. It is. We've officially uh, recorded the longest episode of The Interesting Podcast. Well, there you go. That's right. That Dude, is. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. I uh, talk a lot, and so, you know, this is... I always feel bad uh, when I guest on other people's shows because I always talk too much, but this is a show that I think invites that. So. That's right. That's the beauty of it. I'm, I, just, yeah. I just facilitate the interesting... It's not called the interesting podcast because I'm interesting. Yeah. Right. It's it, like the synopsis literally, literally reads like, a show where Brian Ballas talked to someone whom he finds interesting. Yeah. And that's what it is, and I facilitate that because everyone has stories 
Yeah. And uh, yeah. your story is incredible. And well, thank I you, man. Really, really appreciate you coming on. Well, let me tell you why we're on the air. Congratulations on the engagement. Yeah, um, congratulations on your second kid. Thank you. Yeah, once you find the one in whatever, you know, whatever situation you're in, it's uh it's a scary feeling because you yeah, because yeah, you don't you just want it to be perfect, but at the same time it's a relief relief feeling because you're like you know, I did it. So, you know, like shout out to my wife. She's like the most beautiful, like supportive, amazing person I know because she's not into sports or Star Wars. And uh, right yeah. And so the fact that she is like, you know, I'm about I was like, I'm about to go across the country for 24 hours to go to a movie premiere. And she's like, go, um, you know, and that's it's like wherever Brian Balance goes, you know, the wife is going to be a big part of that. It's the same for like wherever one day Savannah Kiefer goes, the husband will be a big part of that. And I just think that, you know, it's when you find the one, it's always, like I said, it's always a scary feeling, but it's also one of the best feelings. And so congratulations to you. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, us men can be tough to put up with sometimes. Cool. So, for real. you know, so women deserve more, uh, more credit just for that. But, I, uh, hundred yeah. percent agree. Yeah, but she is, uh, my wife is the best, she's a stay-at-home mom, so she's the best mom and the best wife, and uh, anything that I do success-wise is because I've got a, I got a good support system, so. For sure, thank her for me for letting uh, me borrow you for a couple hours. Yeah, no problem, man, I, I could have went for five hours, so, right. uh, you know, like, I don't want to pull the Daniel and invite myself back on when you do repeat <laughs> guest, but you know where to find me, and in 27 28 i don't even know what year it is anymore uh whatever either. whatever Eventually. year it is yeah whatever year it is um we will uh we will we will have you on the force cast while i'm on there and let you be uh bring some balance to the force so yeah there it is there you go end it on that one yeah there that's you go. right and